How's it going, everybody? This is uh, Dave Meltzer from San Jose, California, and uh, we will be talking wrestling for the next two hours. We've got Brian Alvarez on for the first half hour, and then uh, we also have Raven who will be on with us right from the start of the show. He's going to be here for the entire two hours, so we'll be taking your phone calls, one eight seven seven three nine two thirty two hundred. your emails at DaveMeltzer at Iyada.com. Uh, we're going to start with the news. We've got uh, Brian, you up right now? Hey, what's going on? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I was going to ask you a whole bunch of stuff, because uh, I don't know anything that's going on. Um, I guess uh, I guess when we start, did, um, did Beyond the Mat get um, an Academy Award nomination? No. It did not. It was, was it all announced? I mean, is it like final that it didn't, or what's the story on that? I pretty much saw all the nominations this morning, and for documentary, it wasn't in there. So I think that's the final nominations, but I could be wrong. So you might have, want to have somebody call, but I mean, as of right now, it's not up there. Okay, I'm going to go check on it. Because somebody had told me that they wouldn't be, that the best documentary wouldn't be up until Wednesday, but then I got, I don't know, I kind of heard that they were all going to be announced this morning, so uh, I guess it didn't. Um, Brian, real, real quick also, uh, wh I, I got a bunch of emails when I got home about what Joey Styles said on the Law Show, but what did Joey Styles say in the press conference, and what's that all about? I am almost absolutely certain, and the only reason I can't say absolutely is because I don't have it on tape, but I'm almost certain that what he said was that there was a good chance ECW could surpass WCW in a couple of months. I find that oh, that's believable. In what? Not in TV ratings. That's not believable at all. Why not? Uh, if, if, if we get cross-promoted, if we got cross-promoted, which maybe that's what they're alluding to, which I'd like to see, if people knew, like... If they started advertising on Raw and Nitro, you know, nationally, which I know obviously you can't buy national spots, but they, you know, basically canvas it like, um, like, like other shows do, I think we could easily get that kind of, those kind of ratings. I, uh, I just don't no. think enough people know we're on the air. I don't think enough people know we exist. I don't think you're going from like, you know, a 1-1 one, one to, a, to a 3. Um, and I think I the only think... problem that would really stand in the way, even with all the cross promotion, is the time slot that ECW has right now, Friday night. Do I? No, that's not. That's not really. You know, the number of people watching uh, TV on Friday night, it's it's about ten percent less than Monday night. But Are, aren't, um, they in the, aren't they in the twos anyway? Um, they did a three seven last night. They did a two seven the week before. Okay, so uh, I, I was thinking two seven. So, you know, so you figure they're in the mid twos. We're in the low mid ones. I, I definitely think we could be competitive if if, if we got net. If, if if there was advertisements on Raw saying, "Hey, you like this show? Check this out." And a thirty second spot of guys going through flaming tables with thumbtacks, you know, and you know, a barbed wire dildo or whatever the hell, you know. I mean, just whatever kind of crap we could come up with, you know, being facetious with the barbed wire dildo. Of course, but um, and people go, wow! I gotta watch that at least once. And once they watch it once, Paulie's a master of episodic television. They're gonna go, ooh! I gotta watch this next week. He's gonna like the commercial will get you to go. I gotta watch that once. It's like one of those um, you know, one of those shows where like uh, they promise death and destruction, real life police executions, or you know, the whole Fox, uh, the whole Fox uh, line of a real programming where people look like they're going to get hurt, where, when animals attack. Um, you see a 30-second spot for us, and you go, I'm going to watch it once. The, the difference is, is you watch it once, are you going to continue to watch it? Is it going to be one good rating? Or, you know, and, and, and you may miss it the first time. So if we do, like, five weeks of national spots, I think we're going to have viewers because sooner or later everyone's going to tune in to see us once. You watch us once. If you're a real wrestling fan, you know, I mean, if you're a pretty strong casual fan, you're going to tune in twice and three times, and you're going to be hooked. No, I, I, I truly think, believe that. I really don't think there's a chance that it's going to be WCW numbers, and not, not in the next couple months. The only way it could is... Uh, if by some by some means they get on USA Network on Monday night, like if Vince abandons USA, then I think that they could be pretty competitive. But not on not on TNN uh, unless TNN does go. They do have a they're in like a huge amount of cable homes, though, aren't they? They're well. I mean, they're in the same amount of cable homes almost as uh, as uh, uh, I think uh, TNN's about seventy five point eight million, and I think. Uh, uh, let's see. TNT is about seventy-seven point two million. So they're all, you know, they're roughly the same. But I, I just don't see it. Uh, you know, you're talking about you'd have to almost triple. You have to basically almost triple your rating to be where they are now. You have to double it. We're doing a one-three. They do. They're doing yeah, a two, you six, did. Six, you, haven't, you haven't done a one-three in weeks. You did a one-one this week. They did it. They, oh, they did a three. They did a three-seven this week. Although that's unusually high. That's but unusual. they, that's a, that's 
isn't uh, unopposed. That was because it's unopposed. But, um, you know, I mean, for so, two-hour uh, format. Okay, so they're averaging a 2-6. They're averaging not averaging a 2-6. They've they're only done... averaging a 1-2-1-3. One, one, <laughs> they're averaging a 3. They're averaging a 3-1 in the two-hour format. You're averaging you're averaging about a 1-0 one, or a 1-1. One, one. you got a triple. Oh, maybe we got a triple. Okay, so, well... <laughs> That's well, a lot. Then, okay, then give us a few... Then, then, then maybe my yeah. estimation's off. All I'm saying, the point I'm trying to make is... I don't even know what Joey said, but... My, but, but I, I don't I, either. I would expect <laughs> you to concur with the fact that if people knew we were on the air... They would be I don't watching. Believe, believe me, I think that your rating is going to go up, and I don't think there is this, but I just don't think they're going to they're going to cross paths that fast. Well, I'll put it this way: as far as like the the big three, I think that I do think roller jams are going to go up by rate. Go that. I think what? I think roller jams going to go up like a son of a bitch to that rock and bowl. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> I think pay per views they could be competitive really soon. They, I think they're, they're pretty darn close to chance. That, yeah, pay per view uh, you're already competitive. Yeah, pay, pay -view. Uh, fifteen thousand buys separated the last pay per view. Uh, that's that's sure. fifteen, 15 twenty thousand buys separated the yeah, last. Yeah, so they're close there. Yeah. As far as house shows, I mean, I think there's a chance they could be competitive there. You know what our problem with house shows is? Is just a lack of promotion. Yep, you know? that's exactly it. Greg bag of donuts. You know? The thing that you guys have is you don't have the promotion, but when you put on a show, it's a pretty packed show. Where and, WCW and can promote them all they want, but all they do is they promote the killing of a town. We got some wild right. ass people too. I mean, you got guys like Van Dam. I mean, even though he's out, but you know these guys go thirty minutes, twenty to thirty minutes is just nonstop. I mean, acrobatic score. You know what I mean? You know, so you got that aspect. Then you got like Balls Mahoney, who's gonna, you know, catch himself on fire. Then you have a my match, which is a soap opera. You know, like a WWF style soap opera match. I mean, you got the whole gamut, and the people are so lively and so into it. I mean, it, it's truly, uh, you know, and I kind of, I'm kind of pissed that everyone stole this from me, but I was the first one to coin it. But it's the Rocky Horror Picture of wrestling. You know, it's the, the you know it's not quite the same with the fan of, um, participation as it was because the fans used to bring foreign objects. Even the fans brought the, the, brought the weapons. It was yeah. It was the, you know now they take them away for insurance purposes. But it was like now that's why I'm even fighting the crowd because it's boring. I mean all you can do is punch in the crowd. Whereas in the old days, you know somebody hands you a Godzilla doll, next guy hands you a cheese grater. I mean oh it was so cool, you know. But the atmosphere, the people still feel like. They're the rebel fans, you know, and uh, and, and I'll tell you, you know, it's like we're, we're you there? I'm here. All right, my thing, my, oh, my phone was to click. Anyway, we're at some this uh, this bar, the Boathouse, on Saturday, and uh, I'm telling you, the place it, it was ridiculous how mad crazy these people were, and what's cool about it was. Was like um, me, like during one spot, me and Mikey fell out of the ring, went out to the thing, and then I punched him back through the curtain, right? Then you know, just you know, and then I shook hands with everybody in the locker room, turned around and fell right back out of the curtain, you know, just to entertain the boys, you know, behind it watching the curtain. But there was a deep section of the fans that couldn't even see while we were on this side of the floor. And it was cool because they're like, hey, we can't see. And they got a little, hey, we can't see, Chan. You know what I mean? And it's like, but it wasn't like, it, like, hey, fuck you guys. You guys suck. You know, we can't see. It was like, you know, they felt like, hey, we're part of the show. Hey, include us. We pop right back up, gave them their view, and they applauded. I mean, it was like, it, it's a really weird bond they got. You know what I mean? I, it's just, if more people knew about it, I, I just can't see people not wanting to be a part of it. Okay. <laughs> it's addictive. I, I mean, I completely agree with you about the uh, the house show quality, and um, and you know, Brian, I think your your comment was perfect as far as WCW does a great job promoting Killing of a Town. <laughs> I mean, because they come in there, they you know, they generally promote the shows you know very well in the local market, and then you know you have the no shows and you have the poor work rate, and you don't you know you have one third of the roster there, and uh, I'm telling you, so, when I was on the show, when, when me and Hack would be on the cards, and um. We would go out and have our uh, our prop match, you know, our, our carrot top match, and um, and and the thing was, the undercard. I would say four, like four, at least three of the matches, sometimes four. There would be guys wrestling that hadn't even been on TV, that had either not been on TV in the last six months or hadn't won a match in the last six months. You know, what I mean, on both, you know, fighting each other. Yeah. So, like, why would anybody care? Like, the last yeah. thing I want to see is two, you know, jabronis fighting each other. I don't care if they're, like, the greatest wrestlers ever. I mean, if these guys, if they've never won on TV, you know, why would I pay to see them? 
Kind of like the demon, huh? <laughs> hey, Del Zorberg's a good kid. He means well. I know, but it's it's just like they spend all this money. I mean, I was back I was back there last night at Nassau, and I saw this giant coffin-looking thing, and this big, they got to wheel this thing out, and this guy comes out, and they beat him in 10 seconds. I'm going like... No, they didn't. If you're gonna beat him in ten seconds, why don't you save the co why don't you save the coffin when you got your own like Undertaker or something? All that stuff has to be uh, it has to be contractually that they have to do that. They have to be obligated. I, I, I know that. I know, that, but still, then get someone who who they'll let win. I mean, it's just like but it's like that's the they, entire they point. Big, they were like forced into this goofy thing by Kiss, and so they're just gonna absolutely just kill off the character dead. They made oh. a big production and then just killed the guy off. Yeah, every week they do it every week. It's not like they that's just did it last night. <laughs> yeah, it's not like they just did it last night. Well, I don't they, watch they Nitro. I only watch Raw. Yeah, well, I unfortunately, <laughs> I was at Nitro last night, so. Um, well, part by of the your way, job uh, description is you have to watch the program, whereas I can pick and choose what I want to watch. Yeah, I actually missed Raw last night, and it was like uh, about seven or eight miles from my house, but I missed it. So um, we'll talk about that. What? Good show last night? Yeah, Brian, absolutely. tell me. Tell me. Oh, always a good show. Tell me about Raw. Any, tell me about Raw, because I don't know anything about Raw other than um, I saw uh, Benoit give Rock a German suplex after uh, Big Show interfered, and I think I saw um, some Valentine stuff with Mark Henry and Mae Young, but the sound was off. Oh, and that's about all I know. Edible panties. Ah! <laughs> Tremendous. Uh, she, she, goes, uh, I got a, she goes, I got a present for you. And she goes, I got edible panties. And then she actually she was wearing like a teddy. And then she proceeded to put them on. But she, and then she dove in the bed. It was always, it, you can't beat that kind of energy. And the lights went out and Mark Henry said, mmm, tootie fruity. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my oh, my. That oh, showbiz. Oh my yeah, God. it was a real good show last night. They had uh, they had Benoit beat The Rock, and there was interference by Big Show. You know, he gave like a pie face to Rock outside the ring, and Rock stole like he was dead and threw him back in the ring. And the referee's out of position, so Benoit hit a German suplex with a bridge, and he just had to hold this German for yeah, like the ref those ten seconds while the referee's running to get into the ring. And I thought for sure they were gonna drop it, but they did. Yeah, bad play by the ref, but uh. I mean, it happens, you know what I mean? Yeah. I was yeah. surprised he didn't just do the triple German and just roll him again and hit him with another one. But I think um, probably Chris doesn't know the guys want well him being new. He doesn't want to, like, you know. Yeah. He's not just going to start picking guys up and throwing them you know, against the uh, proposed finish. He did give him some chops, though. That was great. But yeah, I, I tell you, I mean, it, it, those four guys, you know, even though it's only three of them because Eddie's hurt right now, but have added so much depth instantly to the company. Oh yeah, and they've just they've just taken the heart out of WCW. I mean, there's just like. Let me ask you a question with this: What happened? Um, Taz fought Hardcore Holly, right? Uh, yeah. And uh, it was an he didn't, he didn't beat him. It was uh, DQ because Crash interfered. Yeah, is Taz in the doghouse or something? Mm, I know he was told not to do suplexes. Did he, did he suplex the guy a lot? Or yeah, no? oh, yeah, he suplexed he Crash up. once afterwards, but because like uh, he won uh, Northern Lights and just won. Uh, he threw Northern Lights and threw one on Crash there, but I mean, I'm just surprised. Hardcore Holly, uh, um, his spots like you know, is is mid card. And I thought Taz was getting a mega push, and then all of a sudden he didn't even beat him. Yeah, which it's I just thought weird, was odd. They started doing those uh, those vignettes with Taz and. The way they were put together was like he was going to come back in like a couple of weeks with this new, harder-edged character, and then suddenly he's just back on TV fighting Bob Hawley and not winning. Yeah, I just Weird. thought it was really bizarre. Or, was it Bob or Crash? Oh, it was Bob? It was oh, Bob. it was uh, Crash. Oh, it was Bob. Yeah, sorry, Bob. Crash. It uh, looked like it's a point. And, and then Bob actually got a really good promo afterwards calling Crash Elroy. Elroy Jetson, yeah. Yeah, yeah but he actually got a good promo. Like, it was funny. I was talking with the who, 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 came, who, came, who came up with Elroy Jetson? Was that Lawler? I think it was Jericho. It was Jericho. Yeah, it was Jericho. That's yeah, right. there, there was a really good band exchange between Ross and uh and the King. Something about gimmicks or something, and, and Ross goes, you're, well, "You're not a real king. It's a gimmick." <laughs> and he said it's really funny exchange. And then Lawler I mean, goes, uh, well, "What about that hat?" And Ross goes, "It is a gimmick." <laughs> <laughs> Ross is so good. He, he, Ross is absolutely. I mean, he, he's far and away the best commentator in the business. And I, and I tell you. But my favorite, my still my favorite thing he ever did though was when him and Hayes were in the UWF. I don't know if I've said it on the show before, but if I have, I'll say it again. Get those tapes when Ross and Michael Hayes were together in the UWF. Uh, when wow. Michael Hayes used to go, "What are you a cop?" You know what? 
He'd always go to Ross. What, you know, like what Ross would like, uh, like Michael Hayes would like overlook some heel interference or something, or heel, you know, using a foreign object, and Ross would point it out, you know, but the referee didn't see it, and then Hayes would go to him, what are you, a cop or something? <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know what was great about Hayes was, was that, uh, he got the match over. He explained to you psychology, like, yeah, why he did a good job with psychology. Yeah. As opposed to just cracking jokes and getting himself over. Yeah. You know, hey, he's so also very funny, and he did get himself over, which okay. he was opposed to because they were like the top heels. But I mean, but he got the he got the match over, which very few um, color men do. That reminds me, what what because uh, I because I didn't hear any of the commentary last night. What did Mark Madden say about Sid Vicious? Because I saw the confrontation, I just don't know what he said. I heard it was Monkey in the Middle. Monkey in the Middle? Okay, I, I, that's that's what that's what I was told. He said, but I didn't actually hear. You know. I don't know exactly what it was, but he said monkey in the middle, and Sid thought he said monkey, and then Sid got mad at Mark Madden after the show for calling him a monkey. It was. What yeah. happened? <laughs> oh, he came up to him and was just like, you know, he, he was just screaming at him for calling him a monkey. Because Mark Madden said that, like, um, there's a three-way at the pay-per-view between uh, Scott Hall, if, if he's allowed through customs, and uh, Jeff Jarrett. Actually, Scott Hall, from what I understand, is supposed to be in Philadelphia tonight. But uh, Scott Hall, Jeff Jarrett, and... Um, and Sid Vicious um, on Sunday at the pay-per-view. And Mark Madden sort of was, was saying that, you know, between uh, Jeff Jarrett and Scott Hall, uh, Sid Vicious is kind of caught like a monkey in the middle. <laughs> and then, So then Sid Vicious, after the show, I guess somebody, you know, told him that Mark Madden called him a monkey. So it comes up, and I mean, and he's got his head busted open because Jarrett hit him with a guitar shot, and it busted it. He's got all this blood coming from the back of his head. I mean, this is off way off TV and everything. And he just confronts him, and he just goes, you know, I know, you know you're trying to be funny in this, but I'm out here trying to draw money, and you're calling me a monkey, and I'm the world champion. <laughs> and Madden's trying to go, but I put you over big, and he goes, you called me a monkey. <laughs> it's like, oh, God. Oh, it was just like, <laughs> it was a scene. It was a scene. I guess there was another scene there with um, Jim Duggan, which I didn't see, but um, was Jim Duggan, Brian, was Jim Duggan even on the show last night? No. Okay, well, there was obviously something he was supposed to do, and uh, and it obviously got cut off the show because he wouldn't do it. And I mean, there was a big scene, um, you know, before the show started in the uh, cafeteria with Jim Duggan. I don't, I don't something know if Jim he, Duggan wouldn't do. Jim Duggan, it's like, Jim Duggan said something to the effect of, you know, I've been humiliated enough. That's it. So oh, okay. whatever it was, he wouldn't do it. Is there gonna be anybody left in that company? Jim Duggan in the wall. I saw the wall uh, wrestle Bigelow. Uh, I don't that remember. was a classic. Yeah, I saw the I saw the Prince score a pin on Billy Kidman in that tag team oh. match. Uh, oh, the artist, the formerly the Prince, Prince and uh, God, who did he team with? Leparka beat uh, Billy Kidman and Vamp when Vamp walked out on Billy Kidman. Oh, and he got pinned. Uh, Brian, are you there? I'm here. I think we lost Raven, are you there? We lost him. Well, he'll be back. What's all that noise? SmackDown did a 5.2, Thunder did a 2.5, WCW Saturday Night did a 1.8. Livewire did a 1.7. Superstars did a 1.7. ECW did a 1.1. 1, 1. Sunday Night Heat did a 3.4. The Dog Show did a 3.9. Oh. Nit Nitro did a 3. Somewhere between a 3.6 and a 3.7. Uh, I got one that says a 3.6, one that says a 3.7. I haven't gone through the calculator yet. The uh, Going through the quarter hours, Hogan and Flair did a 4.4. 4. Nothing else did. Something did... I, I, since I was at the show, I don't know what was in which quarter hour. There was a quarter hour. There were quarter hours of four two four one and four zero. Uh, the uh, Jarrett match. With listen to this, Hogan and um, Hogan and Flair did a four four, and then Sid and Jeff Jarrett came back and did a three four. Well, that's because they put Ernest Miller and the Maestro in between them. Oh, the Maestro came out too. Yeah, I saw Ernest didn't Miller. See that? No, by then I was like backstage. I mean, I saw everything up till the end of uh, the Flair match, and then I was walking down, and I know the, I know Ernest Miller came out and said that James Brown was backstage, which he, which obviously he wasn't, so they couldn't get him. I didn't know anything about the. I mean, I saw the Maestro like a hundred times, but I never saw. I didn't know that he went he came out. He came out and he confronted Ernest Miller, and they yelled back and forth at each other for a little while, and then just ran away. Oh my God! And that wow. was uh, following Flair and Hogan, I might add. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know that's your question, Dave. Do you yes. eat when you go backstage? Uh, it's the same as if I go backstage anywhere. You know how that goes. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like, I mean do, a lot, do, do a lot of the boys, are they happy to see you or they want to strangle you? I mean, how's it work? Uh, it's, yeah, it's pretty kind much. Of, kind of I mean, I mean, I didn't get, I didn't get, I didn't get any heat at all. If that's what you mean, I got. You know, I mean, the guys I know were happy to see me, and the guys that I don't know, 
Some of them, you know, some some shook my hand and some of them didn't. You know, don't get beat up. In other words, yeah, right, no, not even sure. close. No, not even close. Not even close. Nothing close. Um, I was trying to think what uh, the thing that was really scary about that show live was. The crowd was so into Hogan, and it's really scary because I mean I I really there's one thing I gotta say I learned from last night okay and being there and everything. I can see what happens with all those guys that run the company and they go to those shows and they see Hogan come out there and Flair also as well go out there and they're by far the most over people in the show and it kind of blinds them because the the diminishing crowds and and, and and like you know like last night they hit 5500 paid at Nassau. It says a horrible paid attendance for that building. Wow, that's terrible. Okay. I mean they had, but they had over 9000 in the ring. So they I mean in in the building. So they had you know like 35 3600 comps, okay? And, you know, the comps and the pay, they're out there, and they're, you know, they're cheering Hogan like he's, you know, it's just a little, a level below the rock. I mean, it's huge. It's just yeah, a huge yeah, reaction. Yeah, so it didn't used to be like that. I mean, yeah. I'll give you a good example. I used to get a, le legitimately, and you can talk to anybody who will legitimately tell you, I would get as loud a chance or louder than them every time I was out there without nearly the push, you know. But, you know, it wouldn't make a difference because I was only Raven and he was Hulk Hogan. You know, I mean, I he mean, wasn't... You know, maybe like, maybe in Nassau, maybe he did overpower everybody else, but back in the day when when he was getting, you know, when he was on TV every damn week, people didn't care that much. I mean, you know, he was over granted, but considering his push, like, you know, what another, you know, I would expect him to be five times more over. There was a lot of guys, Eddie Guerrero would routinely get Eddie Sucks chants. They were definitely louder than Hogan chants. You know, DDP he would get louder DDP chants than Hogan. You the know, thing I'll is, get yeah, Raven's uh, chance louder than Hogan chance. They were at Nassau last night, and also if they had like 3,000 comps, then you got to think that that's like 3,000 casual fans who, you know, because, I mean, a hardcore fan is going to call the day tickets go on sale or whatever, and the casual fans will pick up the freebies or whatever. And if you got 3,000 comps there in New York, those are going to be the people that remember Hogan and Flair. And, and you got to remember, this is, that's Hogan's backyard. I mean, you know, that's, that's Nassau Coliseum. That's Hogan's turf. That's where Hogan made his bones working for Vince. So, I mean, and, and I'll give you a good example. One night, me and Bob Backlund went out. And uh, this was this was years ago when I was Johnny Polo, um, the albatross known as Johnny Polo. And um, we went out and uh, to some strip club, and Bob was just doing jobs on TV. And we walked in, and you know, yeah, I mean, he hadn't been on TV what 10, 15 years at that point when he first came back and started doing jobs. Uh, uh, let's see, what it was, it was about, it was almost, it was about nine or ten years. Okay, ten years, and he was just doing jobs, and people thought he was a god. I mean, people, I, I mean, they were practically bowing. Well, which, which I, well, I, mean, I thought that was so cool, because Bob's like the greatest guy. Just a sweet, you know, just a sweet, nice guy, you know. But, I mean, these people were just, like, bowing to the, you know, the North, Northeasterners are like that. I mean, they have their favorites, you know, and they stick with them, you know, forever. And Hogan really, I mean, let's face it, he spent, what, seven years on top for, for Vince in the Northeast? And that's all Coliseum, that's New York. I mean, that, you know, that that's his backyard. That, that, you know, that's like the Sandman coming back to the ECW arena. You know, I mean, if he didn't get that kind of reaction there, I'd really be alarmed. Uh, also, I want to mention Raw did a 4.3. Um, where was it? The other thing, on, on the Hogan thing, see, the deal with the Hogan thing is, is that, like, I could see where it, like, bl blinds the, the management that sees that pop. You know, you come out of the building going, like, wow, you know, Hogan and Flair are, are way more over than everybody else. But the problem is, is that, is that by booking in that way, you're just keeping the problem going because it's very clear that, that WCW has that old face image, you know, as the, the old the company. Quo. And they got it, they, they got, yeah, they've got to get rid of it and they bring Hogan back for this, you know, for this cheap thing, but all it does is undermine, you know, all it does is undermine the development of the young guys who are all still caught. I mean, everyone heard, like, uh, if you listen to the show yesterday, you heard Billy Kidman, and I mean, you know. Didn't he bury Kidman on some uh, radio show? Hogan did, which, by the way, I, I, we, should get to, we should get to that. Yeah, Ho Hogan buried Kidman about a week ago, saying that he couldn't even headline at a flea market show. Wow. And he sort of went to some people and tried to act like he was doing it as a work, but nobody believed him. And um, in fact, last night, uh, Canyon gave notice to WCW or, or tried to get asked. He asked for his release, and okay. whether they'll give him, yeah, whether they'll give him his release, I don't know. Um, but he he asked, and um, among the reasons he said was that Hogan comment because he said when Hogan made that comment, and you know you know that uh, Canyon and Kidman are pretty tight. And he said that, yeah, he said that. 
when he heard that Hogan made that comment, it was like, I mean, that's what the top guys really think of us. And, you know, it's sort of like, you know, you sit here waiting for it to change, and there's new management, and there's a new booker, but nothing ever changes, and he just want, he just wanted out. I told Chris yeah. last week, too, you know, we were out to dinner, and I told him, I said, you know, I don't know why you're sticking around. I mean, you know, you're just you're way too talented. They're never going to use you that way. They're never going to see you. You know, it's like you got to leave to come back. You know, if you well, want to be yeah. a star, you have to go somewhere else to be a star to come back. It's exactly yeah. how it is. You know, that's what that's funny is that's what everyone was saying backstage is that the only way to be a star in WCW is to go to WWF first and, and make it there, and they'll bring you back and put you over. And, and it's like even if you go there and you're not a star in WWF, you know, like they'll bring Brian, you back and put you over. Like like Brian Adams is the perfect example of a guy who – or, or DOA. I mean, DOA, when they were in WWF, they were the probably the bottom guys in that whole company. I mean, they were totally not over when they were there. And they come in WCW, and now they're part of the top heel group. I mean, the top heels on that TV show last night were, uh, you know, except for Flair, were Jeff Jarrett. And, uh, and Flair wasn't a heel. Nobody, there was no one who booed Flair. I mean, even against Hogan, Hogan got more cheers than Flair, but Flair got no boos in that building at all. Um, but anyway, the, you know, the only heels were Jeff Jarrett and, uh, DOA, and you know, DOA, Ron and Don Harris. So, anyway, um, there's one thing, I, before we go to a break, I actually got a way to go to the break, but I got to ask you this. I'm not sure if we have any emails asking this, but I figured it would be the first thing. Uh, what's the story with with you and Paulie from, um, I guess, about a week ago with, this, with the uh, the angle with Justin and Lance and everything like that? And uh, how did, you know, asking for a release or offering a release or what's no, the whole story? You know, on what happened was, was a miscommunication between me and Paulie, really. What, what had happened was, Paulie's always told me that if you disagree with something, then disagree, you know, and we'll discuss it, you know, and we will, we will come to an agreement, you know, if you truly believe in what you think, and, um, let me think back what it was, I mean, I've already been so far, I mean, I've totally forgotten the thing, but, um, oh yeah, I know what it was, he had wanted me to go out there and get laid out, and, uh, I disagreed with that, I, did, I disagreed with working with Justin in the singles, you know, without proper build-up. I thought, I mean, Justin, the first time we should ever met should have been in a, as a single, should have been a pay-per-view match. But that's not my decision. Quality sauce going in different directions, which is cool. Um, but he wanted me to be laid out for quite a long time. And, and I just kind of felt, I was like, you know, I just disagree with that. Um, because, you know, I don't mind doing it if everybody else is doing it. You know what I mean? But when I'm the only, you know, when I'm the only guy that continually sells, you know, Sells to that capacity, you know, it, 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 it's gotten me over it, and, and, and I truly believe in selling. But after a while, I think it's going to backfire, and that, that was the whole big thing. And um, we just went round and round with it. And Paulie had expected me to step up to the plate because Van Dam was more injured than he knew. So was uh, so was Jerry Lynn, which I didn't know. Um, he also the night before there was a miscommunication, so I didn't work. So. Yeah, I'm not thinking, you know, why, in my mind, why would I step up as a leader any more than, you know, what I normally do? Because you know, I didn't even work the night before and I was dressed. And, you know, so I mean, it was a miscommunication. And, and basically to boil down to, I think somebody had, had talked to the sheets and given them some verbiage that was relayed to me. And so I defended my actions, which caused, which caused Paulie to make sure that he stayed in his case. And then I had to clarify the facts on that. And um, it turned into this like little cat fight that was just really silly and childish, which I which I uh, intimated in my uh, in my rebuttal. Um, and the bottom line really was that uh, that Paulie basically Paulie said, you know, his point was you picked the wrong weekend to disagree with me, and my point was, well, you didn't tell me. If you would have just said it's the wrong weekend, I would have said fine. I said I'll you know I'll do whatever you want. I don't agree, but I'll do it. You know, and that's really what it boiled down to. As far as me and Justin. Me and Justin are pretty tight. I mean, like, he'll do anything, uh, you know, anything that I say, any, you know, whatever I want to do. I mean, it, you know, I'm one of his favorite people to work with. Um, in fact, the entire match, I, I called the entire thing in the ring. You know, that, that was another thing that got misconstrued. Um, Paul is going, well, uh, you know, he's going, whatever, and I'm going, like, just ring the bell. And Paul's like, you don't have your match together. And I'm like, ring the bell. And he's thinking, he's taking it, and everyone's taking it, and I'm hot, you know, which to an extent I was about other things, but not about that. Because I don't need to set up a match. And so we went about, um, I think we probably went about 15 total in the ring, probably over 20 with everything. And I called the entire thing in the ring, you know. And so Justin was ecstatic, you know. I mean, he came back, you know, happy as hell that, to be involved in a match where two guys called it in the ring and had, had as good a match as it was. And I, 
I, wa- I just watched the tape um, last night, and I mean, it's not going to be some of my best matches, but definitely I think it was a hell of a match, especially considering that we called the whole thing in the ring. Okay, uh, let's see, what do we have here? Um, let's see, Scott Scott Hall, uh, any, any update on Scott Hall, Brian? Nope. Okay. Didn't hear anything today. Hey, I got a question for you, by the way. Somebody emailed me that was at Nitro last night and said after the Hogan Flair match, like a ton of people left because they thought the show was over. Uh, they made it real. Over to my show, and Ernest Miller. <laughs> they, they made they made it real they made it real clear. If you're at the show, it was made real clear that the main event, that the final match. Well, not, they didn't really make clear which order it would go, but they, you know, several interviews were building up Sid and Jeff Jarrett a lot more than Hogan and Ric Flair. I mean, Hogan and Flair. Did no interviews in front of the people. I think they did some backstage stuff. Um, well, you know, another thing that was really interesting because I was actually sitting with a couple of reporters um, last night, and the first well, time. What kind of reporters? Uh, as a book writer, you real know, guys. Real journalists, you mean? Or wrestling reporters? Uh, real. I, I call them. We'll call them real journalists. They weren't wrestling reporters. So right. I'm sitting there, and um, they show Hogan backstage. You know, three, four times during the show, and every time they show him backstage, I don't know if, if this came across on TV or not, but he was booed heavily. Okay, and they're going like, oh my God, they're going to cheer Flair like crazy. And I said, and I told him, I go, the minute Hogan walks through the screen, everyone is going to go crazy for him. I don't know why. I go, these same people that are booing him, I, and I go like, you know, I'm pointing to these people that are booing. Him. I go, look at these people that are booing him like at ringside. They're going to like pee in their pants when he comes out. I don't know why this happens, but they will, and they did. It's just but, because those fans, that, you know, the fans at ECW that are, um, you know, that are so hardcore and so ECW. And, you know, and they're like, you know, screw everybody else, but then they're at everybody else's shows. Yeah. So. You know what's funny about that? Those fans, you know, that's really funny. It's like, I remember, like, some of those guys where, um, where, you know, you see them, like, you know, you know the guys in the front row at ECW, because everyone knows them because they're the same guys that have been there since, you know, probably 93, 95, whatever, you know, and they're on, on every ECW arena TV, they're right in front of the hard camera. So you kind of know them, even though I actually don't know any of them. I kind of think, like, oh, yeah, I know that guy. I know that guy. So anyway. And you see him like when WWF, of course WWF's hot now, but even when WWF was cold, I just remember like one time that like, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it was the Bushwhackers, but it was some ridiculous comedy team out there, and they're out there doing like the, you know, the I, I think it was like a Bushwhacker walk, and I'm just going like, this is so funny, these same people who are like, we love ECW and screw WWF and WCW at the ECW show, um, and they're chanting, you know, like, you know, uh, screw like, uh, you know, Dick Flair, Dick Flair, whatever it was that the chant that Shane got going. And then when they would go to the other show, I mean, they would treat those same people like they were like gods, you know. It's all part of it. That's why it's Rocky Horror. It's all, it's all part of it. You know, it's part of the being a part of the show. That's why wrestling is so much better than any other sport because you know you never see the guy lose in the 18th hole and then raise his arms in the air like he won. <laughs> would, I think would be, frankly, if I, if I was a pro athlete, actually, I've seen, sport, I've seen, that, I've seen that in boxing a couple of times. <laughs> but that's you know I would be a total heel. You know what I mean? You'd get yeah. so over, it'd be ridiculous. Um, you well, know, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens to the XFL. What was it? I was uh, I was talking to some people last night, and they just don't believe that Vince can do a football league without working the games. You know where where I was thinking? Where <laughs> I was thinking about, about that for like two weeks now. Yeah, the one where I was thinking about this um, was was. You know, the big thing that everyone's saying is, you know, the difference between this and the USFL, uh, on the football, I'll get out of the football real quick, but the difference between this and the USFL when it comes to um, the thing is that Vince is not going to compete with the NFL because he's going to pay the guys less. And, and that, I, I, you know, I, I think we should do like an over and under poll on how long it takes between the, when after the first year the NFL siphons off every good player developed in the XFL that Vince doesn't just go, you know, like like Paulie has to sit back and take it because he doesn't have the money, you know, to fight. He can't fight WCW and he can't fight WWF when it comes to money. He can't do it. You know, Vince has a ton of money. Well, and Vince they a five-year deal, so they can't go nowhere. Well, it depends on how the deals are structured and how. Then okay, and then you got okay, but then you've got certain guys uh, that think they're good enough for the NFL. They may want to go to the they'll, they'll choose the World League for less money because it's ticket to the NFL. And then he's going to be stuck with it, even though he's got the second high salaries, he's going to get the third rate players. Because, uh, you know, if a player, you know, the World League is, is basically a, a farm system for the NFL, and the Canadian League also, you know, has working, you know, ties with the NFL. So if Vince is going to sign these guys to long term deals, you're going to get a lot of guys. You'll get the guys who think they have no prayer to make in the NFL will go, okay, I'm going to sign for the money. But anyone with an NFL dream is, if Vince is going to make it a five year deal, they're going to go, well, you know, uh, this is giving away my dream to play, you know, uh, you know, pro wrestling football. You know, I mean, I'm not a football fan, so I don't 
follow up. But I mean, but you, what you what you will probably get is more characters. You know what I mean? Well, oh, oh, of course, of course, that's what he has to do. Right, that's what he has to do to make so, it different. I mean, so let's let's say you're not quite as good, but you're five times more entertaining. You know, I, I think that you know they'll benefit. You know, they'll benefit with that. Okay, now then, here, yeah, okay, but no, then so, on the field, if you're a great character, but you can't catch the damn ball. Well, I mean, if, if you're good enough then, to then, catch it, you know, that means that means. I mean, that, that means you're going to have to start working the games because if you've got this guy who's a running back who's like super, super entertaining like The Rock, but every time he carries the ball, he's like too slow and they tackle him, I mean, he's going to have to like do something to make sure that guy gets his like, you know, his couple of touchdowns well, would, or, else, would, or else he can't do his dance. I would think with the amount of people playing college ball, you know, the amount of people playing, pro, you know, ball out there, that there's got to be enough guys that are equally talented, you know, not quite talented enough for the pros, but talented enough that are also characters, and you can get enough combinations of the two that you're going to pull, you know, enough stars out of it. Okay, but what happens when you've got, like, the most entertaining of them all, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden when he's on the field, he can't do anything? He's the worst player. He's the worst. You get the best interview, and then he goes out on the field, and he gets... I don't think he'd make it to that point. I mean, if he was that sucky, they would never use him to the point where he'd find out he was that entertaining. Well, what if he's marginally good in college, but just not good enough at this level, but he's really, really entertaining and he can talk great? I mean, it's like there's just that lure of, you know, what do you, you know, you know what I mean? Like the, the refrigerator? Like the refrigerator. I don't know. <laughs> but the refrigerator, at least, the refrigerator at least had his touchdowns that one year when we played on a Super Bowl team. Hey, hey wait, come on. The only reason he was on the, on the starting line or whatever he was, I didn't even watch, was because he was a refrigerator. I mean, he wasn't a star athlete by any means, was he? He was a great, great college player. Um, yeah, but he was a mediocre pro, wasn't he? He was a mediocre pro. I mean, I'm not a big but, but football fan. But look at fan. the he got. But um, but he was a gimmick. Because, he was a gimmick, but uh, he scored a lot. Well, the gimmick is that he scored a lot of touchdowns that that one season, and the Bears went to the Super Bowl, and I think won the Super Bowl. If I don't, if I, I'm sure, I think they won the Super Bowl that year. So it's like you're on a Super Bowl winning team, and you're kind of the freak of the team. But he scored. If he didn't score those touchdowns, uh, he wouldn't have gotten over. It was the touchdowns that got him over, and then the fact that he was 360 pounds or whatever he was. Uh, Brian, how much longer can you stick? I got to get out of here. Okay, Brian, real quick, tell everyone what's up on the website. We got news updates today. We have the transcript of the Yahoo chat that I did last uh, Wednesday. And when you read it, if you have any questions, go to the bulletin board because the answers are all, probably all up there already. Plus, we have reports from Raw and Nitro last night. We got a news report from yesterday, and the online observer and figure fours up there as well. So check that out at WrestlingObserver.com. Okay, thanks a bunch, Brian, and we'll be talking to you uh, tomorrow. And, uh, hey, guys. Okay, we'll see you later. And uh, we got Raven here for the next uh, night, a little he less. Kinda less than... He just kind of raked your eyes right there. He what? He just kind of raked your eyes there. <laughs> raked your eyes tonight, I'm out here. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, um, anyway, we got Raven wrestling here. Wrestling terminology is fits in everyday life. Like, everything in the world can be applied by wrestling terminology. Uh, like, I've learned that, too. been in the business... Like, the more you use wrestling terminology, like, you know, you know, like if you go, if you go meet a chick in a bar and, and you, you get a little rap going and then the chick just blows you off, you know, you got your eyes raked, you know. I mean, <laughs> it's amazing how everything reverts back to wrestling, and which makes me think of something. You ever seen the movie Tin Cup? That's the golf movie, right? It's a golf movie. No, I didn't see it. Tremendous movie. Um, the guy that, uh, Ron Shelton, the guy that did it, he, um... He just did that movie Play to the Bone, which was only okay. But he also did Bull Durham and White Men Can't Jump and, and uh, Cobb. Um, anyway, it's, it's a phenomenal movie. Kevin Costner, Rene Russo, and Don Johnson. Little love triangle story. But uh, it, it, I loved it because they, they all talked in golf terminology. It was like wrestling. You got to watch this movie because it's like, you know when you're around the boys and, and everything has wrestling terminology? They're, they're, the movie, they all used golf terminology. Yeah, I've seen baseball people where they all use baseball terminology for everything, too. Well, rent a movie, did you? And, and any, uh, anybody who's a uh, art did a business will uh, get a kick out of it. Okay, two things real quick before we get to the calls. Uh, we've got a poll that's up and running. It's still not any wrestling questions. It's uh, how old are you? So any of you who uh, know basically your age, um, and since this is unanimous, uh, anonymous, you uh, you know you should really tell the truth on this one. So whatever age group you fit in, it's a real simple question. It's, e it's almost as easy as if you're a male or a female. Um, and the other thing, uh, oh, regarding that. I'm 35. Is that, is that your real age? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um. What else the, do I look? Oh, I, I don't know. The, um. Page the, is 55. 
She's like 55. <laughs> really I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, hopefully he'll, uh, he'll be listening, but I doubt it. Uh, Paige is on here tomorrow. You know? Yeah, tell him I said he was 55, but he looks damn good for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's like, I think he's like, I don't know, he's early 40s. Oh, we, always, we always tease him to death, though. Yeah. Um, I was he's about, a big brother I never had. Yeah, you know that uh, I was sort of told yesterday, we were I was in New York and talking to Bob Meyerowitz, who, who runs all this, and they said that uh, they did like, uh, they've been doing like demographic things for advertising purposes and stuff um, on all the different shows. And, you know, like, um, I think 20% of the listeners to this are from outside the United States, which is, I guess, kind of impressive. The other thing was that on this show, as compared to every single other show, when they ask, like, where you're listening to, you know, in the office at home, you know, blah, 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 you know, what place are you, in, are you listening? This show, unlike any other show on any of the uh, stations, had a, a high percentage of people saying that they listen to the show while in school. So I'm just wondering, like, uh, you know, I mean, it's like, I, I mean, I do remember as a little kid, and, and you, you may even remember this, like, you know, sneaking the radio in and listening to something, you know, in the middle class. Did, but I know what you're talking about. Okay, but how do you like sneak the computer in and listen to this show? Well, I think don't uh, don't kid. I mean, I don't know how school works today, but like my roommate. Uh, <laughs> I, don't need, I don't either. <laughs> my, my roommate goes, he, like he decided he was a musician, right? We've been best friends since eleventh grade. He decided uh, music didn't work out for him, so he goes, I'm gonna be a doctor. I go, you're 34. He goes, I don't care. I'm be a doctor anyway. So he tried himself off to med school, and uh, so you know, so I got. A, he was gonna buy a computer, but I, buy, I was buying one too. But I still have no idea how to use it. But he takes it every day to school with him. So I guess. Uh, so I mean, I know he brings it to school with him every day. But he does listen to our show. And, and until, until I learn how to use it, then I'm taking him back. Yeah. But I, you know, but I guess that's how you know. I guess they take. I guess. I guess these kids today they take their computers to school. Okay, let's let's go to the calls finally. We got Steve in LA. Steve, you got me and Raven. Steve. Steve, are you alive? Snap out of it, boy. Let's go to Chris in Georgia. Hello, how are y'all? We're uh, we're doing good. Okay, sorry, you caught me while I was changing a diaper. <laughs> Oh, oh, isn't oh it? my God. First off, Raven, I just wanted to uh, tell you that it's, uh, you're one of my wife's favorite wrestlers, and she doesn't like wrestling, so that's saying a lot. Tremendous. <laughs> I, you know, I get that quite a bit, actually. She, uh, something about, about the fact that I just absolutely worship the ground you walk on, and she's been uh, been submitted to watching you for a while. and <laughs> she's she, forced she really on it. <laughs> <laughs> and what does she look like? Uh, well, she's pregnant oh. right now. <laughs> yeah, never mind. <laughs> She's pregnant with our third child, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, third but, uh, time's a charm. <laughs> yeah, well, and no more. No more at all. But uh, I just wanted to call and tell you that uh, you're one of the best wrestlers out there. I've been watching you from 96 on. 96? Uh, well, who was I in 96? You were Raven in 96. Okay. Yeah, it was just when uh, ECW was on um, on Sports South here in Georgia. It was being aired late night on Friday nights, and uh, that's when I first got the taste of ECW, and I haven't been able to get off it since. Now, would you concur with me? Like, like Dave doesn't seem to think that uh, the ratings should go, could, could skyrocket that rapidly, but I truly believe... Then if, uh, although I, I'm just, I just picture in my head, how are you doing the computer and doing diapers? But, uh, regardless, um, I just, uh, don't you believe that if, if people knew we were, ECW was out there, like if they were given five weeks of national spots on Raw and Nitro, oh, easily. that the rating would go up to at least a two and a half in no time. You have such a better product than WCW, it's ridiculous. I actually wasted two well, hours I of my I don't argue life. that, but I just don't think that the rating's going to turn around that quick. Well, I mean, they, they I mean got the high it, cards with TNN. They got, always snowball. I mean, when Vince took off, I mean, bam, he took off. When, when something, R.E.M., R.E.M. just hovered around the, like, I used to like it, I used to, uh, or I used to use R.E.M. as an analogy for us. I mean, we just hovered around underneath the, the radar. But then when, when all of a sudden, you know, ECW, except we never quite, I kept thinking we were going to break it big like R.E.M., and we never quite did. But uh, right around the first pay-per-view, I'm going, it's going to catch big now. I just We just didn't have the uh, the national following because nobody knew that it was out there. But uh, I, when, when things break big, I mean, well, what, 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 REM was like a you know huge college radio, right? And then finally, what was it, Murmur or Document or one of those, they finally had that hit single. I mean, and, and bam, they were just colossal, you know, not forgetting the fact that they were pretty damn big before that. If you want my opinion, and this I think really is the trick to it, when y'all start hitting the smaller towns, the areas that y'all have not been doing live shows, 
once people get to see you live and once they get to associate it live and on television, then your numbers are going to increase. Well, see, here's, here's the thing, though. But I don't think it's so much going to the live, I mean, I'm sorry, to, to the venues. I don't know this anymore either. I, I think it's, it's people, it's, if, if, you know, if, it's like we go to these towns and sometimes we don't sell out the buildings and it's because no one knows we're there. You know what I mean? It, it, the whole thing is based around television. You know, it doesn't matter. We can go to all the venues we want. It's, it's, it's different than rock and roll and that constant touring isn't going to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not going to do it. It's you need TV. Well, I work at a television station, and I'm trying to uh, get the programming director at the television station I work at to get hardcore television on. Yeah, it's, it's just a matter of TNN just doesn't, they won't cross-promote us. No. They will not, Although, wait, I did see a commercial. I was watching Raw. Last night I saw a commercial for ECW, and I don't know if it was a national spot or just a local Georgia spot or Atlanta spot. Uh, some, someone actually emailed us just a second ago and said that uh, that uh, the, the um, TNN does advertise uh, on Raw and Nitro in Atlanta, uh, the ECW show. Yeah, in Atlanta it does. Yeah, but in I don't Atlanta. Know, but I think I don't know about anywhere else. Major markets. But, yeah. I mean, but, but until they do it in all the markets... You know, people just, and, yeah, and the thing is, I think it takes a good five day, you know, a good at least five day weeks for people to go to finally, to give them time to catch the show. But once they see it once, I mean, I just really believe that they'll watch it every week. Is, is not, it's must see TV. Is not ECW the number one rated show on TNN? Oh, yeah. How, how do you not cross promote your number one rated show? Um, I don't know, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm kind of pissed off about this. I was watching Roller Jam the other day. They got pyro. I want some damn pyro. Yeah. You know. Roller Jam. I don't know about Roller I want to be on Roller Jam too. But didn't y'all have I to? Can, I can roller skate, damn it. Didn't y'all have you know, to? You can get on, you can get on Roller Jam. Jam. They would die to have you on that show. They I want to be on the dome. I want to be on the but I want a pair of quads. I don't like them damn inlines. I want a pair. Of, you know, I can actually moonwalk on roller skates. Believe it or not. I used to be like a floor guard in a skating ring. I was like, I don't know if I told this story before either. I got a lot of stories. You, know, you never know which stories I've told where. But uh, I want to go on Roller Jam, man. It looks like a lot of fun. Plus, they got hot babes. They got to get those girls on uh, on ECW. Yeah, well, uh, if you know anybody at Roller Jam, tell them I'll do the show. Uh, I, don't, I don't know anyone. I don't know anyone. But um, Mark Diamato, at one point, he and I were corresponding about doing the show, and then I lost his email address. So anyway, I just, uh, I don't know if it would be good for this show anyway, really. You know, I mean, it'd be good for me because I just kind of be curious if you know a guy who's been doing this for you know who goes back to the seventies. But uh, eh, you know, the wrestling roller derby crossover it was like huge in the early seventies. No, I, I want to do it just because I want to do it. I mean, it exists now. If roller derby would have been big, would have stayed big, I probably would have went into that. Although I don't know if I mean when I was like eight or nine. I mean, if I had to make a choice, it would have been a tough decision. You know what I mean? Hey, Raven, do you watch Roller Derby on Classic Sports Network? No, I, I, don't, I don't get Classic Sports Network. It's uh, great stuff. It's the original Roller Derby from back in the late 70s, early 80s. You know what? I, I don't remember the stars, but I do remember my favorite high spot would be when they would all lay down on a big pile, and then the, and the guy would have to jump over it. I saw the guy, um, we talked about this on the show, I saw a guy do like a, like a corkscrew plancha uh, over the pile. Yeah, the other. Me, yeah. yeah, the last time you were on the show, yeah. Speaking, of, I saw Aaron, Evan Courageous do a corkscrew plancha last night at uh, at Nassau. Evan Courageous, he's um. <laughs> <laughs> there's something about Evan. I guess what about, if you got nothing good to say about someone, don't say anything at all. There's something about Evan Courageous. I mean, I used to think like it was almost like uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, like he was like the epitome of everything like uh, wrong with wrestling for a while there. But now, like since he's been on every single week, and that gimmick is so unbelievably goofy, and the other two guys right. are hilarious. I actually kind of like the gimmick. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm, I'm like starting to like it. But okay, now here's the other thing, though. As, as a single, as a single, we call them the Lex Luger of the cruiserweights. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the thing with those three guys, now, oh god. But the thing with those three guys is that um, they, they keep beating them, though. It's like, it's like you know. It's like, who's going to take seriously guys that lose in the opening match? You can't keep losing it, man. People don't get yeah. that. You can lose, but you can't. Keep you know what? Losing. You can lose. You can. I think you can lose all the time if you're, like, competitive or if you're, like, given, like, uh, if you're, like, a Ric Flair or someone like, you know, like with you. Who, well, you, no, know, no, can no, talk. you know what? I, I'll, I'll clarify it for you. Because me and Terry Taylor used to go round and round. Like, he would always call me in, and, and he goes, he called me in to negotiate the finish, right? And, um... That's what I was just trying to do. Let's negotiate a finish. And he go and like and his big selling point was when trying to get everybody to do jobs was he goes, 
Arn Anderson did jobs every night and never lost his heat, which is true. But my response was, well, he was a four horseman. He got promo time every single week. He always had a belt. He always had a damn belt. He always had a tag belt. You can be me every week and I'll, and I'll stay over too. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't think it's, you know, granted, Arn is one of the best promo in the business, you know. So, you know, so not just anybody could do that, but all I'm saying is that Terry Taylor's, the logic was flawed. He used to drive me nuts. He'd go, he'd go, he goes, Arn would get beat every night and so was he. I go, yeah, but he has all these other things going on. You know, if you just want to beat me for no reason, Terry, I go, I don't get it. I mean, I'll do it. I'll do anything. I mean, I've always been a team player. I go, but give me a reason. I mean, you know, like, uh, you know, I, I, that's one thing with Paulie. Paulie knows that I will do a job for anybody, anytime, anywhere. Doesn't doesn't matter. All it's got to do is make sense. I mean, just there's no reason to beat somebody though, just to beat them, unless that's their position on the card. And if you're going to make somebody into something, then obviously that's not their position on the card. Go ahead. So you have to find your way right. around it. Black Dave. Hole. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, what happened, Dave? Um, I, I, got, I got cut off. Uh, this is from John, who says that he checked that he listens at school because he listens when he's at college and they have fast Internet connections. It's not my home, so the closest possible choice was school. I bet most people who checked it were in college. He may very well be right. Um, this section for you. It's a question off the beaten path. It says, what do you think of the rock band Sabotage? He used to wear their T-shirts all the time, and, and I was just curious about it. I'm friends with a guy, Chris Cafferty, who plays in a band. Um, I like him. I mean, I'm, I'm, my musical tastes tend to run towards the 70s. Um, 70s classic rock, 70s Philly soul. Um, I guess, you know, because I'm 35, so it's what I grew up on. You know, that, that and I like the early 90s when music changed. And, and I really think that um, when the alternative age ushered in, I think it was like a throwback to the 70s sound in, in many ways. You know, much more raw and, uh, and, the uh, much more raw. It was, it was much more raw and unpolished. I hate, I hate really polished sounding music. Okay. Um, by the way, um, if anyone's out there, um, could you email me what the WWF stock's been doing since I've been on the road for the, I guess I could look up, I could look up yesterday's in the newspaper and I could probably. Yeah, but anyway, I need to make some money off of that. Yeah, anyone, uh, just let us know what the stock price is. Uh, this is something that, um, I guess in, since I was so busy actually watching the match, I didn't see this bit of silliness that um, happened. I guess we got actually a few comments on this. At the Flair, and during the Flair Hogan match last night, they sent a whole bunch of ring crew guys out there uh, with cameras to pretend it was like international media converging on the Flair Hogan match. And uh, this is someone who says the uh, Flair Hogan match was pathetic last night. I don't know. I, I mean, I didn't think the match was pathetic. Um, you know, it was it was a Flair Hogan match. It's the same Flair Hogan match. I saw the the second Flair Hogan match in history in Oakland, California. It was supposed to be the first, but they actually did one at a TV taping three days earlier. And this is like '91. And this was like it was like the exact same match. It wasn't even slower. It was shorter. I mean, it was shorter and it wasn't as good. But I'm just like watching like these spots and it's just like I knew every single spot. Um, but anyway, anyway, he goes, they had so-called photojournalists who you could tell were ring crew members who they gave cameras to. You know how they could tell they were ring crew members, Raven? How's that? They were wearing shirts that said ring crew on them. No, they weren't. <laughs> yes, they were. It said WCW ring crew on them. Isn't that awesome? That's, you know, to me, I just don't get stuff like that. That's why I think Vince is, is so great, because stuff like that will not happen on Vince's TV. <laughs> no, that will never happen on you, Vince's you know what TV. Else? You'll never see a cameraman on Vince's TV. Um, I used to see Aptor and stuff uh, on Vince's no, no, TV. No, 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 a cameraman, one of Vince's cameramen. Oh, 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 oh okay, yeah, almost, oh, almost never. I mean, almost never, you're right. I mean, they're so good at that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, but that, that was part of the things, I mean, you know, I mean obviously, because I used to produce, I mean, I know... The inner workings, I mean, but that was part of the thing was, I mean, was, you know, Vince, Vince is that professional. I mean, it's just down to the tiniest little detail. And to me, that's what makes the show, you know, that's what separates good from great is the details. Uh, we have uh, about three or four emails asking the same question, which is, is the typical question, and that is, uh, what is your contract status with ECW, and would you, would you consider going to WWF? Yes, I would, uh, but not until my contract's over. Uh, which is August 25th is my last day. And uh, as i stated numerous times, um, I love working for Paulie. You know, we can fight and whatever, but, you know, I love working for him. I think the guy's a genius. 
Um, but I need, I'm 35 years old. I got to make some money so, you know, for, for the rest of my life. And Paul Lee won't be able to pay me that kind of money. They're definitely moving up. They're no longer a Bush League outfit. I mean, they're definitely, a, you know, I would, you know, it's the big three now, not the big two, you know. But, uh, you know, I, I got to go where the, where the big, big money is because, uh, you know, I feel like I deserve it. I, I think my talent warrants it. You know, I mean, we'll find out come August 25th. You know, if the WWF is interested, but uh, you know, I'd like, I'd like to think they are, um, and uh, I would definitely consider it. Before we go to the calls, I, I want to make also one comment about a couple of things that we've been asked a lot um, on email today, and that's the status of uh, Sabu, Chris Candido, and uh, Tammy Sitch. From what I understand, and this is as of last night. Uh, Candido and Sitch were at the show last night at the National Coliseum. They were not going to be used on the show, but I believe they were going to use them tonight in Philadelphia, which is the Thunder tapings. But that is not going to happen because uh, they're under contract to uh, ECW and Paulie, at least as of last night, had not sent a release for them um, in May. When it comes to Sabu, Sabu's on ice right now. WCW is not going to use him. And Well, they're not going to use anyone without a release, but uh, WCW is not going to use him, and uh, and that's basically, uh, it's basically the status of the whole thing. Um, what do you make of all that? Uh, but what Paul trying to get uh, Paul's trying to get uh, WCW to buy the contract to Sabu out. That's what yeah, I'm what it is. yeah, I don't think he's gonna. I, I mean, he's already talked to different people like Mike Awesome and, and Crazy about uh, you know sort of being in Sabu's spot and picking up the slack for Sabu not coming back. So um, you know, I don't know. So uh, I think he's just trying to get something for his, for the contract. That's right. just my my opinion. Uh, let's go to Richard in in uh, Canada. What's going on? Ah, hi there, Ray. It's been nice to talk to you. I always enjoyed you, even though up here I haven't had a lot of chance to watch ECW. I try to catch it on Friday nights. Uh, quick question. Uh, even though you were stuck in all the chaos of uh, WCW, do you think it would self-destruct this bad now with Canyon leaving and only being do, left sorry, with... Do what? He said. He said. Do you think the WCW would self-destruct this bad? I mean, when you were when you left WCW, did you think it was going to self-destruct this bad? when I defected. Um, I, I wonder when, when, when people look back if I'll get any credit for the, uh, let's face it, the exodus, I started the exodus. Um, and, uh, you know, which is recent, you know, unfortunately I started it six months before everybody else started leaving, but I've always been slightly ahead of the bell curve. Um, it, it really all depends. I mean, you know, I hope they let Canyon go. I mean, I want to see Canyon's a good friend of mine, you know, and I'd like to see him go to WWF. Um, I know. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if a lot of other guys on the list. I really don't know. And frankly, if they start, you know, from what I hear, also Vince has a limited roster space. You know, so WCW may let a lot. Of, you know, a lot of guys may say, "Hey, you know what? We want to go," but Vince may say, "Hey, I ain't got room for you." You know, because he's got to. Vince has got to make sure that he keeps on the roster the loyalists, the guys that have been there for a long time that have stayed by him. You know, and. uh but he also needs to add guys that are gonna, you know, up the uh, the ante with like Chris and uh, Chris and Eddie and uh, Perry. But uh, that, from what I understand, there's only there's only so much roster space to use. It's available. Yeah, no, it's just you know, even when you left, I figured they could still pull it out. But uh, well, it's not like they were used to any of us. You yeah, know, I mean, that's the point, you know. It, you know so, well, I don't think it makes a damn bit of difference. I mean, they weren't using us, they weren't gonna. So, basically, to them, it's not like they're losing anybody, you know, in their minds. But that's where they, that's where they made a big mistake. I yeah, think. because they lost all the guys that gave, that gave quality matches. But in their and, minds, these guys didn't draw. But they forget how valuable the dressing they were. Yeah, but then the other the other part of it is, is like, okay... We all know that what needs to be done is to get certain people off of the top of the card. And the problem is is that now there's more there's of a no justification to keep them there because it's like there's exa there's no one. It's like you go in there and you go like, okay, who's going to be on top? I mean, you can't say, well, you can always elevate Chris Benoit or Eddie Guerrero or, or Raven or something. Or Jericho, like, we're all gone. Or Jericho, right. And those are the guys who could have done it. I mean, now... The level of those guys, I mean, it's like, okay, we're, we've got a chance to elevate, you know. I mean, you got Vito, Vito and Johnny into the main events instead of Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan. It's a bigger, it's a bigger jump, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, yeah, a lot I mean, bigger. You had, you had four guys. Well, you, had, you had three guys and me, Chris and Chris, that were ready to step up to the plate. You know, he should have. 
And they uh, they said no. You know, and then the next level is a big drop off. You know, because you know you got you know I, I've been doing this twelve years. Benoit's been doing it for I don't know probably eight. Jericho probably the same. Um, you know, the rest of the guys. What, what you got left is guys that either have had their run and they're and they're past their prime. You got guys that aren't ready for their run, or you got guys that are never going to be that level. You know, I mean, it takes. There's only so many guys that um, have what it takes to be that level. You know, and uh, they lost. Uh, they lost a bunch of them. They're killing Booker T now, so you know, the one guy I think they could actually, you know, go with a bit as a young guy. Until they build up those guys, they're killing them by having them feed with Ahmed freaking Johnson. But I'll tell you what, you know what? Booker T, there's a guy they could build around. Booker T is a stud, you know? I think Booker T's out of town. I still think Paige has got a good couple of years left in him. Mm -hmm. Old bastard. You know? He's putting over young people. Nobody else in that company is. You know, it's, it's not. See, I don't think it should be chronological age. You know, I think it's how it's perceived. I mean... Page is chronologically the same age as these guys, but he doesn't move like him. He moves like a much younger man. This stuff, you know, he works much harder, snugger, and, rugged, and more rugged. So, and, and he looks, I mean, he's, got, he's a well-built guy, you know. Whereas, like, Flair, Flair looks to be getting up near his 50s. He looks to be flabby, you know. He looks soft, and it's a cosmetic business, you know. So I don't think it's a chronological age, you know. But look at Michael Hayes. Michael Hayes is 40, you know. And, and he walks away from the business, what, like 36, 37? Which now, people are just, you know, getting their breaks then. But hell, he already had 20 years on top. Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, so I don't think, yeah, I, you know, to reiterate, I don't think it has anything to do with chronological age. I think it's, you know, how you look and how you, uh, and how you move. Well, with Paige, too, it's TV time on top has been, what, three or four years. Flair has been, like, on TV for 20 years, so you can see the age more. Yeah. Well, I mean, people think of him, people think of him an older guy, but at the same time with the, uh, with Flair, and he's, he's, Flair still has that aura. I mean, I saw it in my shot. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's like, I, I would never be in, fa in favor of getting rid of him, even though they need to, to, um, um, lessen the old face of the company. But at the same time, the idea that, that, that they can go in there and build around Hogan and Flair for another run, that's terribly counterproductive. But even if they can go out there and pop, and, and, and pop a match and get a big pop, it's like, it's just counterproductive. It's like, you gotta rebuild at some point, and this is, you know, this well, has gotta be the time to do it. You know what? My favorite Flair angle in the last three, four years was him and a, him and a X Pack six. You know, and, and Flair was out there and he goes, okay, basically he goes, I'm old. He goes, I may not be able to beat all Nash, but I know I can kick your fucking ass. Yeah. And that was a hot fucking angle because Six brought it out of him, you know what I mean? And the people yeah. go, and that's something where people were elevated Six, you know, elevated, you know, and Sean's a great kid, elevated Sean, um, and also was believable, wasn't like, come on, you know, it's like, come on, we, there's no way people think Flair can beat Goldberg. You know what I mean? It just, people aren't going to think it's Flair, you know, 10 years ago, sure, but not anymore. You know, but where against X-Pac or Six, they go, this is a pretty fair fight. You know, the legend versus up-and-coming snot-nosed punk, you know, how his character was portrayed. You know, and that's the way they need to use these guys. You know, as stepping stones. Not, and not necessarily as stepping stones, but, you know, it, I mean, it's not like, you know, it's, people don't understand, though. You know, you can do an angle. Both guys can come out, you know, looking good at the end of it. You know, just because one guy does the final job doesn't mean both guys can't come out looking good. So it's not like you're stepping all over the guy to get there, you know. Mm -hmm. But one of the, one of the, I mean, and, and one of the things that always pissed me off is like Sting, you know, he like a, what was he, like a mid-card, you know, he was a mid-card guy when he came over. Flair went a 45-minute Broadway, took the guy 45 minutes Broadway, made him a star, get her, at least gave him a chance to become a star. But has Sting done the favor for anybody else since? Has he ever it? returned that favor? Oh. I brought oh. that up to Eric one night. Actually, the night I quit. I go, you know, I go, why don't you have Sting let me, you know, make me a star? Let me step up to the plate. And I go, what's well, Sting going to do what, what Flair did for him? He goes, he goes, he just let Sid beat him last week. I go, Sid's a fucking star. I go, yeah. Sid's been a fucking star for fucking 10 years now. It's not nothing, you know. I mean, Sting was, was a mid-card.
Card Jabroni, you know? He, he was on UWF TV, he was a tag team champions, but still wasn't a, wasn't a star star, and he wasn't nothing really on the TBS network. And Flair, you know, gave him the Flair opportunity. Made, Flair made him, but, but the thing is, is that everyone did know that Sting was going to be a top guy. You know, beforehand, that's why they let him go 45 minutes and Flair made him. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, he was a guy ready to be made, kind of like so, probably so like... So was I and so was Benoit. You know, I, absolutely. Was, was I, Sting doing that for us? No. You, you're at your right. You're, you're, you're right. Than these guys are. Yeah. And that's what that's my big problem. And you know, the well, was anybody going to do it for Austin? No. I mean, they did in New York, but I mean, was he going to do it in, in WCW? No. And they did in the WWF last night. I mean, The Rock, who hasn't been on top for how long, he goes and puts over Benoit. Not absolutely. clean, but I mean, you know. That's why Vince is a genius. I mean, look at Rikishi. He's been around for 20 years, but they've all of a sudden. They found the right mix. You know what yeah, I mean? Look, the guy's cool. always been out of a town, you know, and a great guy. But they finally found the right gimmick, and boom, now all of a sudden, you know, he's, you know, it, it, the son of a bitch is over, like, like a son of a bitch. Whereas in WCW, if they saw that, they'd immediately have him beat off, you know? The same with Too Cool. They were like, you know. Scotty Too Hotty, the guy always considered. Now, there was a guy who I never, I'll, I'll give it, I, never, I, I always liked Scott, and I always thought it was a good hand. But I never thought he'd be more than a good hand. And Brian Christopher, I always, me and Brian go back a long ways. We used to always ride together in Memphis. And I always thought Brian had talent that it, it was underused. And um, and so, but Scott Taylor, I never, I never, I, I just couldn't even see it. And when they came out, and he came up with the worm, and when he does the worm, and then he goes, whoosh, whoosh, and 15,000 people are going, whoosh, whoosh, with him, you're going, motherfucker's over. Oh, you know, man, and, yeah. and but that well, top when he beat Billy Gunn last night? That well, was absolutely. I mean, I knew, I knew he would. I knew one of the two of them were, were getting to win. Um, you know, but the thing is, what uh, and, and what was good about it was that, that he had to have help to get the win because, let's face it, the other guys are the established top guys. These guys are up-and-comers. They were jobbers for a long time. You can't just, you know, they just give them the clean win. People might not have reacted as well. It was better to make it like that because it makes it, like, more of an uphill climb for him, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But, um, it's also a tag team, so it'll build a feud later down the road, too. Absolutely. You know, you, know the, you know, the other thing that people forget, too, though, is that it wasn't that many years ago. I mean, I, I remember, I mean, because I remember, God, I think it was just a few years ago, I remember going to the San Jose Arena and watching Billy Gunn against uh, Jesse James in the Rock opening and match, and they were, they were the two jobbers of the company. And I mean, it, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and now, you know, I mean, it, it's like, and then three years ago, you know, when all those same guys in WCW were in the same place at that time as they were three years later, and they were, you know, they had the same talent. In fact, they were all more talented than Billy Gunn, or realistically. Yeah, one one good push uh, with uh, Cactus Jack at that year, building up to WrestleMania, and they turned from, you know, got, you know, Rockabilly into, you know, and the country. Yeah, Rockabilly. Yeah, I know they gave him a, they gave him a bad gimmick even, and and he, you know, they just they canceled it and they brought him back and. I think, I think I think that was the greatest thing Vince ever did was when at some point he decided that you can't just give out gimmicks anymore. You got to let people be who they are, which which takes a lot of balls to, to say to relinquish that kind of control to go. All right, I mean, you know, all right, you guys got to be find out who you are and let these people be who they are. You know what I mean? Because that's the more wrestling is built on personalities. You know. There was there's about ten years in the middle, you know, in the first Vince in the first set of Vince Glory years where it was gimmicks. You know, you're a dentist, you're an undertaker, you're this, you're that. And um you know, a big boss man, he was a cop, you know, got over just strictly being a gimmick. An undertaker strictly being a gimmick, although Mark was smart enough that when the times changed, he became a personality instead of staying just a gimmick. But if you go back in, in you know, in, in the years, Dusty Rhodes wasn't a gimmick, he was a personality. Terry Funk, a personality. Ric Flair, personality. You know, it's not just, hey, you know, like, I, when people come to me and they go, hey, I got this great gimmick, I'm like, right away I'm already thinking, well, you, you, know, you really don't get it. It's not a gimmick anymore. You know, you need to find an extension of your personality that you can propagate, and you can, you know, because... That's what people, people want to get behind. The more three-dimensional your character is, the more they're going to get behind you. Mm -hmm. That's why you don't see much changes when a person uh, turns these days. Because that's why you don't want to, you, got, you have to speak up. That's why you don't see many changes when a person turns these days. I mean, Jericho heel, Jericho face, there's no difference. It's just, you know, people like Jericho right. instead of, you know, hating him. 
he's still the same Jericho, still cutting the same promos, yet he's getting the cheers now. And I got a couple of emails here. This is um, Chris Benoit will not be on the SmackDown show tonight. His wife is in labor uh, today, so he went back. Uh, to, it says he went back to Canada to be with her. Doesn't he live in Atlanta? I do not know. Uh, he lives in Atlanta, so and I'm sure that's where he went. Uh, and uh, it says Rock will be hosting Saturday Night Live on March the 18th. Really? Yeah, that's the first time a wrestler's hosted Saturday Night Live in. I have to write down on my what? calendar. That should be interesting. In uh, 15 years was the last time that happened. 1985, Mr. T and Hulk Hogan, right before WrestleMania. They did? Yeah, right. The weekend of the very first WrestleMania, Mr. T and Hulk Hogan, the night before, uh, they hosted Saturday Night Live. I remember that. that I didn't see that. Yeah, yeah. And Roddy Piper was on it. Roddy Piper did a big promo on Mr. T. It's actually the best thing on that show. Uh, it's one of the things that got the show over. Uh, this is uh, more, some more people who are listening at school. He goes, I used to listen at school in the computer lab. A bunch of guys at school also listened. Cool, that's great. Uh, let's see. What kind of listenership do you get? I don't know. Like how many people? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. I just we're, I just know that 20 percent. A lot a lot of people listen on archives. I also I, I've heard that. On what? Uh, on our, you know, it's like they're not listening live, but they'll listen like at their own convenience later in the day. Uh, a lot of people will will listen to tapes on the weekend, um, you know. So, um, you know, a lot more than like uh, you would expect, I guess, is what I'm told. Uh, let's see, why are there more missed spots on, or screw ups on WCW than WWF, or maybe is it just no, more noticeable on WCW? Um, they're just because they're greener guys. I think that's you know, in the matches that you're talking about, like with uh, Shane Shane Helms, Shannon Moore, those guys. Um, I mean, there are guys trying to do. There, there are guys that are only two years in the business that are trying to do a lot of stuff, and so, and, and acrobatic stuff. So there's going to be more missed spots uh, than you know guys that have been in six, seven, eight years and are are not trying to like get over for the first time and make people notice them, but are already kind of over. You don't have to do as much acrobatics when you're already over than than to get people to notice you, especially when you're small guys and you're not getting a push. You kind of have to. Uh, how many people ahead. read your newsletter? Uh, let's see. I mean, the the paid circulation is about seventy five hundred. Seventy five hundred. Yes. All right. I was just curious. Yep. 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 That one. That number. I know. Uh, let's see. Uh, it says, I'm wondering what what do you think about bringing Brian Clark into ECW? Me or you? You. Um. It says, what does Raven think about if Brian, if Wrath would be a good fit in ECW, or if Paulie has any thoughts of bringing him in? I have no idea. I really have no idea if Paul is interested or not. Um, you know, frankly, I think anybody with talent, I mean, you know, anybody with any kind of name value or any kind of talent um, is always beneficial, you know. I mean, it, it's, you, you always want to have new, new, face, new faces, fresh faces, fresh talent, because it stirs up the mix, you know. People, the problem with a lot of people in this business is they get something that works and that's it. And it's all they do. And they don't advance, they don't develop, their characters don't grow, and uh, and they become stagnant. And I think that's, uh, you know, they just rest in their laurels, which I, which I think is, uh, is, is really shitty. You know, I think it just hurts the product all the way around. Uh, this is one that uh, you've probably been asked a lot, so, um, but we'll give you a chance to talk about this one. Your angle with Roddy Piper. Well, um, the angle that never happened. The angle that never happened, they did about two, it was two, three weeks of teases on TV. Uh, you know, that the, the, uh, in those, in those vignettes, yeah. I, was, I, was wait, I was waiting for the big angle with Roddy Piper. It was going to be good. Too. Me and Roddy and, talked on the phone about four or five times a week for about a month. Um, and uh, we, we came up with this brilliant thing. I mean, this, this is a hell of an angle. I mean, it would have elevated me into the Big Ten. You know, the, uh, the quotation mark Big Ten of WCW. And uh, so I got kiboshed. But um, yeah. right, like, and the funny thing was, Bischoff, you know, was telling me, he goes, man, we've, we've been trying to find something for Roddy to do for six months. And so me and Roddy laid out this whole hot angle, and they just wouldn't do it. You and know what's was, the, weirdest, the weirdest thing to me as a fan is that they they actually, like, uh, start angles. No, and then they decide they don't want to do it. I threw that in myself. Oh, okay, okay. But but I mean I had heard I had heard you know like uh, for a couple weeks and it wasn't from you or anything that uh, you know they were going to start doing you know what, we're going to bring because Rod, Roddy wasn't around at the time they were going to do something with Roddy Piper and you I mean I had heard that and then there's a few little things on TV and then all of a sudden dead you know nothing ever mentioned again 
big. Uh, man, I got the notes somewhere in that angle. I mean, we had we had like a three four month program lined up, which I mean it was some phenomenal stuff. I mean, you know, part of it was me. Um, some of the best stuff would have was going to be me, me doing the old Piper Pit segments where we were going to make fun of them. And, I, you know, probably someone will eventually steal this idea. But, uh, and so I was going to, like, Canyon was going to dress up like Snooka, and I was going to hit him with a fake <laughs> coconut with, like, a love tap. And he was going to go, you know, go ballistic and jump Stop through a backdrop and knock the whole set over. I mean, we were going to just make a mockery, you know, of Piper's uh, career, you know. That's actually pretty clever. It was, it was, it was a loving homage. You had a mockery at the same time. Yeah. And there was so much more to it that, that, that frankly, that, I mean, I, I could probably find a note somewhere. You know, next time I'm on the show, I'll try and uh, find a note to that. It's a really good angle, though. Okay, let's go to the phones. We've got uh, uh, Mr. T in Connecticut. Is that your name? Yeah, hi. Uh, how are you guys doing tonight? Mr. T, your voice isn't quite as deep as it used to be. Uh, <laughs> actually, listen, I'm, I'm heading to uh, uh, Living Dangerously in Danbury. And I was wondering if uh, I had some you're, you're, you're already on the road. You're already on the road. You're already heading to it already. Huh? I know. I know his name is T-Bone. No, I, I was, <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry. I was yeah, just saying. Okay. I got, I are, got, are, you, are, are you already on the road heading to it? You're going to get there really early. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to that. I was in the last uh, Danbury show you guys did. Uh, oh, that was one. you. Huh? <laughs> Nothing. Sorry. Um, number one, is Mike Awesome scheduled to be on the card for a match? Absolutely. Uh, for you. Uh, you, you, know who, you know who he's fighting? Who will be defending against? Uh, I really heard, don't know. I've right. heard two. Uh, I've heard, heard play Karnak though. All right, I've heard the two, magician. Yeah, cool. that's my Bobby I've Heenan reference for today. Yeah. Okay. Secondly, um, I, I've, I've heard two suggestions. Um, one is a single match with Tanaka, and the other is a three-way with Tanaka and Spike Dudley. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Number two, is there any truth to the rumor I've been hearing about uh, a TV title tournament at the pay-per-view? No idea. There's, there's oh, it's not alerted me to anything. There's, uh, Dave, truth, you know? there's, there's truth that there's a rumor. Uh, it's not been, I mean, it's not like it's 100%, but it's certainly been discussed. So there's definitely a rumor, but there may not be any facts behind the rumor. Oh, okay. No, there's, yeah, fact, there's, facts, there's facts behind that there's discussion of it, but that may, that may not be what ends up happening. Uh, but it's been discussed. Okay. Oh, and also, just one more thing I wanted to add. Uh, Raven, you uh, you were talking about the uh, the crowd participation on, in the shows earlier in the show. And, uh, you know, I was at the last Danbury show you guys did. And the main event, you and uh, you and Tommy went against Carino and Victory. It was like a human pinball match. I mean, I went out from my cheap seat. You guys went into the bathroom. You guys came out of the bathroom. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. I, tried get, I tried to get in between you guys, but the the guards shoved me back. I shoved me back so hard I fell into my friend. And uh, as we were walking back to our seats after the match ended, we bumped into this other kid who was in the bathroom when you guys were in the bathroom. And he's like, oh, my God, I was taking a piss, and all of a sudden Raven was right behind me. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, I mean, that was crazy. I, yeah, I, yeah. I don't recall there anybody being in the bathroom. The kid could have been lying to you. But maybe he <laughs> was there. Um, Atlas Security does a good job. But uh, I, 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 lo I love doing stuff like that. Like, me and Carino just go running around and uh, and just bounce off the walls. And, and the only problem is the fans are smacking you in the back, and it hurts after a while. Uh, like, you're oh. like, ah, ah, ah. You know, and then Carino, like, you know, he's the heels that are really whacking him. So i got to protect him. So I'm getting the brunt of all the wax. But, um, no, it, it's fun. I mean, it, it, by building, like, like, if you can find props out in the crowd, like, uh, like, um, like bleachers to roll down, you know, or different stuff like that, or, you know, stuff to use, and it's fun. But to me, going on the crowd is no fun. Oh, yeah, that's right. We went to the, um, gimmick table. I think this was the show. We went to the gimmick table, and I put a, you a, a coat or mask, or mask on his head. But his head was too big, so I could only get it, like, on his forehead. It looked like he was wearing a Sakosa's crown, right? Yeah. He's like, yeah. he's helping me trying to get it on his head. And then, uh, you know, just goofy stuff like that, you know. And then I made him wear it. I put a Raven t-shirt on him, you know. It, uh, it's fun. Carino's a, Carino's a blast to work with. Well, if, if you can find me in the crowd, I'll be on the floor with a Flock World Order sign. Cool. Cool. Flock, flock World Order. That's cool. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's go to Travis in Tennessee. Travis, what's going on? Uh, yeah, Raven, um... I know there's a lot of lot of reasons that you got. Uh, you got to speak up. Oh, um, I'm sorry. 
um, you was talking about WCW, the um, uh, people like Sting and Flair and stuff not giving you chances, not giving uh, chances. Like, I don't know, you might get in a little trouble over this, but who just really, I mean, who just really kicks you off the worst in WCW? Hogan. Hogan's a piece of shit. He's a fucking asshole. <laughs> that motherfucker sabotaged my career so fucking bad. I mean, every meeting he would go in there, and I got I got a bunch of witnesses. You know, the fucker would go in there and go, oh, this kid can't draw money, this kid can't do that. He's a fucking asshole. Well, there's your uh, answer. <laughs> I, I got I got another question about ECW. I've not I've not seen an ECW bar bar match in a long time. I mean, has ECW is they kind of you know brought the bar bar? I mean, like they it takes the a long time to set them up. You know, to tear the ring ropes down and put the barbed wire up. You know, I mean, I don't think we ever really had a lot of them. You know, um, I'm sure they'll do them again. I think it's just you know it just hasn't come up. Uh. What what are some of the other reasons you left uh, WCW? I mean, like See, the reason I left was because I had no upward mobility. I uh, hit yeah. the glass ceiling. I've I've heard stuff like I've heard stuff all the time about WCW. They don't, you know, they're like it's totally unorganized backstage. Could you like tell tell us some stuff about? Yeah, they're, they're a complete mess. But but all that aside, I can deal with all that. You know, it's it's the fact that that they would not let me reach my potential, and I refuse. You know, I've, I've busted my ass for 12 damn years at this, you know, and you're going to get guys that say I'm lazy. You're going to get guys that say I don't work that hard. But you know what? what my, my response to that is that if they did as much work away from the ring as I did, like, you know, I mean, I may not do all the acrobatics because I can't, you know, and I may go out there and have like and do five times less than the other people. But as long as I'm getting as much or more crowd reaction, then I'm doing my job because my job is to entertain the people. It's not to do a bunch of bumps to entertain the boys. And um, and the amount of work I put in to make this character believable, to uh, to come up with the promos I do, you know, and, and, I, and, and I will give Paulie credit. Paulie also has a ton of input into him, frankly, because he knows where I'm going and I don't. Um, but uh, whenever I whenever I do, I like you know, when I was in WCW, they were 100 percent mine. Um, the, um, but with me and Paul, it's a collaboration. Um, which is also kind of fun, actually. It's fun to collaborate. But, um, you know, the amount of wrestling I watch at home, the amount of thought I go into, you know, into doing this is, uh, you know, it's, it's, that, that's what this, that's what, you know, it's, it's it just, that's what's so irritating about not being allowed to reach your potential. You know, if I didn't work at it, if I didn't work as hard as I did, then I'd be like, you know, whatever, I don't deserve it. But, I mean, I busted my ass. I deserved more money. I deserved a better spot. I deserved, uh, you know, I deserved, you know, I deserved all the fame and fortune and glory and everything that that goes part and parcel with being a major star. You know, and being that I am as insecure as I am, these things are very important to me. So, so there. Ah. Ah. Next. Anything else? No, that's, that's all. Okay, let's go to Dave in New York. Dave, how are you doing today? Okay, I'm doing okay. Here you go. Um, that's it? Just okay? <laughs> did you watch the show last night? Did you watch uh, the Nitro last night? Me? Yeah, you. Uh, yeah, you, buddy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I was okay. just wondering. That's all that you, question. You, you were the one. <laughs> Well, I wasn't. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't go. I just didn't. You know. What, you know. Actually, I, you know, I got to bring up. Somebody brought this up the other day. One of my buddies. And uh, <laughs> do you remember when I did? When Vince let me have the, I had the radio, the WWF radio show. And, the WWF and, and, radio and show. Vince had me commentating yes. on superstars when when Lawler was off, and I had the uh, the voice machine, like the yes. sound effects machine. This is, yes, I remember that. What did you think of that? Uh, I don't know. Time. Uh, it was it was way out of its time because I, I remember I was like, oh. the boys over that. But somebody brought it up the other day, and I was thinking you could do it now because now now you know I've always said it's showbiz. You know what I mean? But I don't know what made me think of that. The two things that stick out for me from when you were in WWF were when you first started managing the Quebecers and you came out in that hockey jersey that said on the back, "We are the Quebecers, Jacques and Pierre, and I am Johnny." Yeah, but that's but that that is Disco's favorite thing in the world. Is because they're foreigners, you know. Instead of saying and I am Johnny, like in a contraction, and how people speak in English, yeah. it said and I am Johnny. 
Like, he just thinks that's the most ridiculous thing. And instead of saying, I'm Johnny, and I am Johnny. Like, it's so formal. The other thing that... The and, 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 and let me say that the night I walked out, I realized I had true heat. Because this was back before fans really cussed and stuff and whatever. Mm -hmm. And I walked out, and it was the Manhattan Center, and some fan goes, Fuck you, Johnny Polo! And to, to elicit such um, such a um, venomous response, I was going, Hey, I'm getting over. The other thing that sticks out is when you were playing basketball with Gorilla Monsoon. <laughs> I remember the bowling more myself. When I slid down the, uh, where I did the gimmick where I had the, my fingers stuck in the ball, and I slid all the way down into the, into the pins. Oh, no, really? Oh, my God. I You know, I, I missed that one. Oh, it was, it was ridiculous. We did, uh, you know, then I dry, then, of course, Gorilla hands me the ball. I drop it on my toe. You know, I mean, all kinds of goofy stuff. I, I loved working with him. Bless his heart. Dave, did, what did you think of the uh, Jim Duggan press release that I sent here? Oh my, Raven! You haven't heard about this. There's a TV show that they're um, that they saw. We're selling the Nappy Convention called um, what, Bikers Court, right? Yeah. Yeah, Bikers Court, and it's um a jury of it's it's it's, it's basically trying to capitalize on three shows. One's pro wrestling, obviously. One's Jerry Springer, and the other is Judge Judy. And it's um, bikers, like these twelve bikers as jury, and then like um. Jim Duggan is a judge with a two by four, and they have these like absolutely ridiculous cases. Like uh, I guess in the uh, pilot, I love it already. I the, swear to you, I love the idea already. I have the pilot okay. in front of me. I'll read the description for the pilot, okay? Okay, you yeah, read it. It's actually it's actually brilliantly ridiculous. Go ahead. The first episode features a group of plaintiffs suing Big Tobacco. One of the plaintiffs is a midget who claims that smoking is to blame for his stunted growth. <laughs> is asking for compensation for what could have been a lucrative NBA career. The slogan for the program is, when court, court gets rough, Axel gets tough. Victims find justice and criminals pay, and if necessary, they receive a two-by-four upside the head. I love it. I, thought it was I, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's right in the, uh, it's perfect for Comedy Central. I think it's one of those shows that, that, would, that would get a cold audience and would, uh, I, I love it. Oh, I wouldn't mind being a judge. I just hope it doesn't take itself too seriously. I wouldn't mind being a guest how, judge. How, 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 could a show with, how could a show with Doug and take itself too seriously, though? Mm. He's a good, he's, Jim, Jim's a really good guy. Uh, let's, uh, for, got a question for Raven. Is, do you think that your strength is as... Oh, uh, by the way, um, I got to put over James Vandenberg. He said to me, uh, during the break, he called me and said, plug him. So I, I, there's no reason to plug him, So, but... uh. <laughs> So shamelessly, I'm plugging him now. James Vandenberg. There. There, Andy, leave me alone. Also, um, I wonder, uh, Supernova, you know Nova on our show? His brother, Donnie B, is a manager and a master ribber. And uh, so he was going to call in and harass me with goofy questions today. He did last time. I forget which one, which caller he was. And now I'm trying to decide if he actually got through and if anybody asked me any goofy questions, that it might have been him. I don't really recall any. Uh, I just wanted to ask you before I got to my question for Raven, what did you think of that other thing in the email I sent you about the poll results from WWOR? What? Oh, 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 oh they had a they had WWOR. No, what was that? Was like was that for like the greatest wrestler of all time or just the greatest wrestler right now? Oh, I didn't the greatest really... wrestler of all time. The and greatest wrestler of all time. You know who won the greatest wrestler of all time? Who's that? The Rock. Who else? Really? Uh, yeah, Hulk Hogan was second. And, and also the third. And uh, my uh, yeah yeah and then the, the greatest heel what was the greatest Raven heel of all time was. Uh, was uh, who was Triple, that? H. Triple H was the greatest heel of all time. The greatest tag team of all time was the, were the Outlaws, right? Followed by the Hardys and then the Rock and Sock Connection. Wow! It's like well. how on MTV they had a vote for the greatest album of all time, and the number one choice was the Christina Aguilera. That, it was Backstreet Boys. Oh God! I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's really sad. That's 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 just it's just well, uh, our polls come out better than that, although. <laughs> You know, I mean, when we had, uh, like, the greatest wrestler of all time, I mean, Hogan got, you know, what was it, like, like 60, 70% of the vote? Wasn't it something like that? Well, Maybe greatest that? or most influential? Um, actually, I think it was, um, okay. you know, most, I think it might have most influential essentially. Because if we did greatest of all time, I'm sure that Flair would win. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm relatively sure of that one. So. You know, anyway. it was funny that there was a poll on a website that I saw. It was who will benefit most from... Candido and Fitch signing with WCW, and uh -huh. the one that got the most votes was Bret Hart. 
What? Oh, God. <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, so anyway, my question for Raven is... I was just saying, but, 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 um, you said that Bruce Hart's going to be on what day? Wednesday, Wednesday or Thursday? Thur Thursday. That's going to be interesting. interesting. Oh, okay. Bruce Hart's going to be real interesting. Yeah, I need yeah. to get a copy of that. How do I get a copy of that? Uh, so I have no idea how to work my computer. Uh, well, find, find someone who does and just, uh, you know, Thursday like, can night. I, can I get it emailed to me or something? Like a transcript uh -huh. or how's it work? No, no, you just go go through the thing and then you click through whatever you have, you have to click through to get on and, and just you can do it. You can listen to it live or you can listen to it on archives, you know, like for the next 24 hours. All right. I'll my roommate figure it out. So. All right. What's okay. your question? My question is, do you think that your strengths are more as a brawler or barking straight matches? Because I thought... Some of the better matches you have were like your match against Jericho at Halloween Havoc a couple of years ago and your match at Spring Stampede last year, which were more straight wrestling matches. I think my strength lies in my ability to play to my opponent's strengths, A. Eh? So, like with Flair, no matter who he wrestles, he has the same match. Whoever I wrestle, so, so you know, so if, like if he wrestles me, I'm wrestling Flair's match. Everybody's wrestling Flair's match. Whereas me, I wrestle my opponent's match. So if I wrestle Jericho, I wrestle at his style. If I wrestled The Rock, I'd wrestle his style. If I wrestled Austin, I'd wrestle his style. If I wrestled Pillman, I'd wrestle Brian's style. Um, which makes it that I have a different match with everybody, which makes it much more interesting to me, and I think for the fans. But my other strength is, is my ability to come up with complicated, um, labyrinthine, labyrinth, I can never pronounce that word, labyrinthine, um, finishes that lead you one way, swerve you the next, and keep coming and coming and coming, and just when you think it's over, it leads to a whole new set of circumstances when you're convinced that it's over, and then we go into something else. And Oh, like with the match that you did in ECW where the Pitbulls won the tag titles? Yeah, the uh, double dog collar. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Which I, which I think was one of the best matches I've ever been in. You know, and like considering it was, you know, with the Pitbulls, I'd say that's quite a, you know... What's the deal? What's the deal with Gary Wolfback? I just noticed Gary, that this Gary's a good friend of the Sandman's, and uh, and he's a, he's a really good kid. You know, what I mean, he, he's not a bad worker. You know, I think he just, you know, I don't know. And I, 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 he fell off the radar somehow. You know, his business is. Just talking yeah. about the um that double dog collar match, and I realized that I wanted to ask you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, what happened with that bump where you kind of almost got decapitated on the table in that match? Yeah, well, this is what happened. Okay. Anthony and the pit bull, they were going to super bomb me through a table. And I told Anthony, I said, super bomb me through it. I said, I'm going to kick out because I was going to let them kick out of my finish. So I figured, you know, you know, if I'm prostituting my finish, you prostitute yours. Um, he decided that, that, you know, it was a really dick move. He decided that uh, he didn't want me kicking out of it. So he was gonna fucking bounce me off the thing, you know, so I don't go through it. Being the dumb shit that he is, that just, A, he could have killed me, which is a fucking bullshit thing. B, it just made me look even more superhuman because it looked twice as devastating fucking bounce off that damn thing than it did going through it. So, you know, it, it, it was an asshole play no matter how you look at it. That was pretty, you know. You know how there are just some things in wrestling that make you cringe like that? Oh, yeah, it, and when the Jerry... one thing that does it for me is, is uh, when uh, Ben Watts throws Sabu in the air. Uh, oh, and they clip, they show it over and over. I forget Sabu told me. I forget whether he's supposed to turn or he wasn't or whatever. I mean, it wasn't, you know, I think it was just one of those fluke accidents. And he landed right on his head. Oh, my God, I can't even watch that footage. The ones that really make me cringe, other ones, are when... Waller hit Dreamer in the crotch with the cane and when he got crotched on the post by Idol and Rich. Right. Oh, that's because Waller sold it so darn well. I heard that he actually got a ruptured testicle from that. No, 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 no. He sure did not. He was going in for a surgery to get a vasectomy reversed that next, like, three days after that, and that's why they did that angle. <laughs> yeah, that, I'll tell you, that, 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 was, that led up to the, one of my favorite angles of all time, the, uh... The hair the, thing? When, uh, when Tommy Rich came out from under the cage. And the hair thing in the cage was... That angle, Austin Idol put up all the money. And, uh, we, you know, we covered this last week, didn't we? Was that the last time you run? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the whole build up, the yeah, Austin Idol interview. That. You know, never mind then. You know, and then, and, 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 yeah. I got so many stories, and I never, and I never remember which ones I tell on which shows and which things. You know, I hate to repeat myself because I got so many. Okay. But, uh, we, 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 we've got to, we've got to run through the calls because we're running yeah, low on okay. time. Okay, I just want to say that Raven, that one of Raven's best ideas was to have that Matt Classic segment on All American Wrestling. Was what? Have the Matt Classic segment on all on all American. That was just that was just so I could watch the old matches in the studio. 
that I used to edit it. So, I mean, it was, I thought it would be good for TV. I thought it would be good for ratings. And also, that way I get to watch all the old matches. And had this classic 76 match between Dusty and Superstar Billy Graham when they both had the robes on, man. Oh, yeah, you told us this story. You told us this story, too, where they were so over and the match was really... <laughs> okay. I remember that now. i got to stop coming on your show. <laughs> that reminds me. I, I swear, I, I, I think the WCW Saturday night should be consist of half new guys, you know, and then actually I don't even think they should have the new guys because the new guys aren't. Yeah, you know, I don't. I don't think the new guys should be exposed on national TV until they're a little more ready. But if they're going to do it, they should have half of it like stuff from the '80s that's like really, really good. I think the ratings would go way up with those old clips than it is right now. You could have a whole highlight show. Yeah. Uh, we got like, like remember on Sunday Sunday. The Sunday show could just be highlights. Right. Yeah. For for years and years. Okay. Let's go to let's go to Mike in New York. Yeah, Dave. What's up? Listen, you Not guys are talking about all the guys in the WWF getting over and stuff, like Road Dog. Road Dog only got over when he started stealing his whole act from Snoop Doggy Dog's uh, Doggy Style album, you know? I mean, they should be, WWF should pay, be paying royalties to Snoop Dogg because his whole entire act is stolen off of Snoop Dogg's album. Everyone steals stuff. I mean, that's, that's, yeah, that's, he, that's, he, that's how we learn. <laughs> get Snoop Doggy Dog's, uh, I think it's 93 Doggy Style, get that album. He stole everything. Everything he says on the mic, he stole from that album. You know? And another thing is, I want to say, you guys are talking about oh, everybody who's not getting over it because they're being held back, this and that. You know, you got Raven there. You know, uh, Corey Feldman only has a certain shelf life, Raven. You know what I mean? What's up, Nova? After a while, you start getting played out, you know? <laughs> like Corey Feldman and Corey Feldman. Corey Feldman, man. You're, you're acting like a Corey Feldman. People, Corey Feldman gets annoying after a little, a little while. Nova Donnie B. I can't yeah, even hear you. It took you long enough to get on the show, you damn jabroni. Yeah, listen, <laughs> Billy Kidman and all those guys are not. When Sid has a five-minute match, and you write in the newsletter, Dave, oh, he, Sid's not over. But when Kidman gets a five-minute match, it's all oh, he's told, told to go home early, this and that. I mean, these guys are boring. Billy Kidman's boring. I mean, how can you dress this guy up? I mean, Hogan's got the biggest pop at the Nassau Coliseum. Everybody's making excuses. You know, I, I didn't make excuses. I just said that it's like it's not the thing to be doing because they got to be rebuilding, and whether whether there's you know, you can't rebuild around 40-year-old guys and turn a company around. And that's you got Raven back there saying, oh, you know, it's Nassau Coliseum. I would I would have thought Hogan would have got booed at the Nassau Coliseum because the new Long Island crowd is brutal. You know, they, they, I thought they were going to boo him. Well, they, they did every time until he came out. <laughs> every time he was on the you video know, I mean, stream, they were booing him. You guys who can't get over it. You know, no, I, I pay 5 to $10 extra a ticket to keep the luchadors and the Japanese off the card. And I, mm -hmm. I, I'm, a, I'm a fan. I'm, I'm a hardcore fan. I subscribe mm -hmm. to your newsletter, and I don't like those guys. You know what I mean? And you got all these guys in ECW getting over. They're only getting big pops for their music. I mean, a few years ago, you, would you have the Bad Crew coming down with March of the SOD? SOD. That song is getting a pop. Not those. Not those clowns. You know, you got Raven coming out to Offspring. Everybody's popping for for the Offspring, not Raven. Absolutely. You know Watch what I mean? Bring, all these promos, you Raven, you were ripping off Black Sabbath five or six years ago in ECW. You know, and you know, we acclaim. You know, promos by Raven. I mean, no, I was ripping off Black Sabbath back in ECW, not WCW. That's what I'm saying, back in ECW, man. Yeah, absolutely. You got all these great That'd promos. That'd fucking rocks. You know? And what, Billy Kidman, he didn't, he didn't fit into a group like with the Filthy Animals. When I think of Filthy Animals, I think of Filthy, Filthy Animal Taylor from Motorhead. You know, you think of a... You think of Lemmy from Motorhead. Should have brought Lemmy out. What was that? We should have brought Lemmy Kilmeister no, out and put him in the If I would have put a Filthy Animals together, I would have someone... You would have had a better look for the Filthy Animals than, than, than Kidman. I would have put you in there. I would have got Brian Lee, maybe put him in there. Some stuffy guy. The bulldozer? You know? What was that? The bulldozer, Brian Lee? Yeah, well, what, what was he? Where is Brian Lee? Lee? April, or whatever his name was. I would have put him in that group. Not Billy Kim is going, yeah, with just a couple of filthy animals, Gene. The Gene Oakland. What the hell anyway, is that about? Hey, hey, where is Brian Lee at? I don't know. That's a good question. He's I falling off the radar. Yeah, he's another one. VH1, where are they now? You know. Yeah. They gotta get Corey Feld Raven. They gotta get you and Corey Feldman together, man. We gotta get a new caller. Cause it's uncanny, <laughs> man. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Hello. Hello. Nice caller. Okay, Mike in New Jersey. You're home. You're there. Yeah. What's up, Dave? Are you uh, Raven? I just wanted to ask you one thing. I heard this thing about how uh, you're thinking of something like of bringing the flock back with you or something. I was just wondering if any of that is true at all, and like who you had planning on bringing in with you. What flock and where? Um, I have no idea. <laughs> I heard that, like, if you went to WWF, you were going to try to maybe bring the flock with you. I was just wondering, like, if any of it's true and if you had, like, plans for who to bring in with you. Frankly, I haven't even talked to the WWF. Really? Um, I'm going to worry about that when the time comes. Yeah. Um, all I know is, is that I'm going to, the Raven 
Raven character is me. Yeah. Now, I'm going to say the Raven character. That's cool. As far as whether there's a flock or there isn't, or how they want to use me, or if they even want to use me, they may not even be interested, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not that vain as to think that everybody wants me. I am pretty vain, but I'm not that vain. Yeah. Um, so I really have no idea. As far as now, you know, I'm currently a baby face, so I really wouldn't have a flock, I don't think. Yeah, that's true. But, uh, you never know. Yeah. You know, flocks are, you know, you know, whether it's Raven's Nest or Raven's Flock, it's always good. What, what I like about having excessive people is that you can come up with much more creative finishes. Yeah. You know, every time you add a person into the mix, you add one more, uh, one more definite false finish because, um... Okay, let's say, let's say, just for wrestling 101 psychology, mm -hmm. let's say I got three guys. So let's say schmuck number one comes down. Let's say the guy's, um, the guy's about to put it on me. The guy hits me with his finish. Schmuck number one comes down. The guy goes one, two. The guy gets up. Blast schmuck number one. I schoolboy him from behind. Everybody thinks that's it. One, two, he kicks out. I go to take a wild swing, and I'm, and I'm making this up as we go. The guy knocks me on my ass. Schmuck number one's out because he hit the railing. Schmuck number two pops up. Right now, I'm like because because the guy hit me. I'm trying to get to my feet, but I'm hanging on to the referee, so he can't see. Schmuck number two slides in. It's the guy with his finish. I crawl on top. The referee makes the count. One, two. The guy kicks out. Oh my God! The place is shitting themselves. Right. I yeah. go to shoot the guy off. The guy ducks behind me. Um, ducks underneath. Hits me with his finish. But schmuck number two has the referee. Schmuck number the guy's covering me. Schmuck number three slides in. Hits him with his finish. I roll on top. One, two, three. Now you've gotten like. False finishes that really mean something, as opposed to just, you know, as opposed to just a guy covering a guy and saying, hey, it's a false finish. <laughs> it's not a false finish. What a false finish is, is when the people are convinced it's a finish, and it, it's done in such a manner that the people are convinced that it is a finish. But it really isn't. That's why it's false. Yeah, that's... Sort of like a false pregnancy. Yeah. <laughs> but that's why I like having, um, you know, a group of individuals, you know, whether it's uh, Meanie and Nova, which, which Nova was your last caller, Dave, by the way. Either oh, yeah. Nova or his brother was your last caller. Um, I, think, I, think, I think it was, uh, yeah, it was Nova. It was, and it was Nova. one of the two because uh, yeah, yeah, otherwise okay. you wouldn't have a Corey Feldman or a Corey, the two Corys reference. Anyway, um, you know, whether it's a Meanie and Stevie and it's a comedy act, whether it's Kidman and Scott Vick and those guys, you know, and what was great about those guys was these guys, like, like the, the reason they got over was I made sure that they didn't just run in and kick, kick, kick and do the Rockettes act. Yeah, like, they, they, you know, they like, came I made them come in and do, you know, like, I go, all right, what do you want to do? How do you want to do, you know, Billy, what do you want to do today? You go, I want to just fly off the top. All right, you fly off the top, miss him with that. Let a page diamond cut you. Uh, and I, you know, how can we lead in the six diamond cutters? Uh, Scott Vick, what do you want to do? Stop page, let miss that. But all these guys could work, so, you know, it wasn't just, hey, let's all do the Rockettes and make the guy fight out of it. It was like high spots. So it was much more intriguing than uh, just a bunch of guys, you know, kicking and stomping, which I think is dumb. And which I think, you know what else I think is equally dumb? Is when a guy, after, you know, when they do the run and everybody's kicking the guy, you know, what I never got was the guy who gets to eat is the guy that stands there and milks it. Like, let's say me. Hello? Hello? Uh, uh, we lost somebody. Anyway, let's say me, Paige, and Canyon run in on somebody. And Canyon and Paige are kicking the guy's ass. I'm just going to stand there and raise my arms in the air. Who do you think is going to have the eat? The two guys kicking or the guy raising his arms in the air? The guy raising the arms in the air. Because he's the guy that's going, yeah, hey, we're getting over. People are going, fuck you, you suck. That's basic, but nobody gets that. Everybody wants to kick, 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 kick. That's not where the heat is. We are out of time. So we got. Well, good thing I was done talking. <laughs> I know. I was just waiting. So anyway, we're we're out of time right now. We're gonna have uh, Diamond Dallas Page on tomorrow. We're gonna oh, have Bruce Hart be involved? on Thursday. If if Nova calls up again, <laughs> and uh, that's that's pretty much it. So anyway, for everyone, we'll be back here at uh, 6 p.m. tomorrow Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Pacific.